Welcome to Sound Mind Beats Podcast. We go live Tuesday, 8 a.m. Mountain Time, USA, every week. Please come and join us on TikTok. And in case you missed it, we're going to be uploading the full versions here on YouTube. Thank you for listening. What's up, dude? Dude, that was quick, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm mobile at the moment, so I'll be safe and keep my camera off. Cool, cool. Yeah, no problem, man. Got, got to take care of business. I get it. Yeah, my, uh, my kid's a yuck mouth. She had two cavities. So she's, oh, wow. she's getting the drill right now. So that teach you. Uh, that will definitely teach you. <laughs> yeah, that's brutal, man. That's, that's, uh, Dennis is no fun ever. No. And, uh, you know, you know, try to do the good parenting thing. And like, fortunately, like, you know, they've got some good lessons, but this is like the, like stuff in the back teeth, you know, where, yeah, you missed that flossing back there. So yeah, cavity creep came up to bite you. <laughs> yeah. Those are the, it's always the back teeth, right? Yeah, for sure. It's like the, the the little stuff that you, you don't check. I think there's a there's a metaphor about life in there. You know, <laughs> it's about the, it's about the details. It sure is, dude. <laughs> a metaphor about life. I like that because that's exactly what it is. Any, so anything? You, you uh, said, go oh, ahead. I, I, I wonder. You said you were. I was watching the live thing yesterday, and you were. God, you said something, and it reminded me about. It was talking about like the something with, uh, you know, it was like the, you had the issue with the base and it was like, it was like too much and it was like overpowering things. Right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so I heard, I heard this thing the other day and it reminded me, uh, when you said it and it's like, and it, I think it, there's these life lessons that, you know, can be profound and also practical in how we approach mixes and stuff. But to this guy was saying there's two kinds of people. And I think there'll be two kinds of tracks. And the, the two kinds of people are those that when they walk into a room, they say, look at me. Or they say, hey, look at you. And I was thinking about that as you were talking about like the base thing. And that's like one of those yeah, it's like that overbearing personality that thinks everything is about me. Look at my look at the, look at this sound. Look at this thing, and how it in itself is not really supporting the other tracks, and in fact, it's getting in the way. You know, versus like somebody that comes in, and I think that you probably maybe work with producers or session musicians that come in, and the, the ones that uh, are like, hey, when they walk in the room everybody else is better you know versus everybody else is like oh god here's this guy you know just coming into with his big personality having to take over everything you know anyway i was thinking about you 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 mentioned that about that that bass track and i was like yeah i mean we have that in life we have that in the professional relationships that we deal with and then (laughs) there's also there's always that one track that just is like nope i'm gonna come in and do what i want (laughs) You got to deal with it. I, I love how you put that, dude. Um, and to catch you guys up to speed, um, he was just talking about something I spoke about in my um, my live yesterday. I had a, a bass track that was just overpowering everything, and just kind of discussed how I'd address that, and just given an analogy of it. And yeah, that's very well put, Brian. I really like that. And good morning, Christian and Kingdom. Come, welcome in. I, I, I and good morning. I, I don't know your name. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Isaac. 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 Hi, Isaac. With two, hey, hey, Brian. It's always two A's. I've misspelled Isaac for years. <laughs> yep, with two A's. With two A's. <laughs> it's not I S S A C. You know. <laughs> Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And from my understanding, Kristen got a new toy in that he's going to share with us today. <laughs> awesome. Oh boy. So we're, we're going to geek out today and talk a lot about gear, I'm sure. Wonderful. Actually, I, I have well, the same any, thing any that Rob has. To talk with other gearheads, like that's, that's, that's a nice day for me. That's a good start. Oh, 100%, bud. Like this is, this is the fun stuff right here, right? <laughs> Actually, so are you in like, um, are you in your commercial space? Is that what that is? Actually, this is my home. 
It's oh, my home okay. studio. Um, wow. We built out a space uh, during the pandemic. I was looking for a building or before the pandemic, I was looking for a building. And then my wife said, you know what? We have the garage that we don't use. She goes, why don't you just convert the garage into a studio for yourself? She goes, if this ever happened again, you have the space to do what you need to do. So here we are. <laughs> Looks beautiful, man. I love the panels. Like love the the, the painting, the, the track lighting. Look at the backsplash. Yeah, you, you. So this this here, this is actually a product called Audimute. Uh, this is actually. I was gonna product. say. The, the, yeah, Mitch. Yeah, Mitch. Yeah, yeah Mitch, me and Mitch, we we connected together. This is actually a prototype. This is a thicker version that he normally sells. And so he yeah, sent me the prototype to test out for him. Dude, the audio and, uh, stuff is awesome. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it completely changed the space, changed the room and everything. So this is my tracking room, so. Got you. Um, so that that is just more of like, back there would be like, um, uh, it's like a rock. Is that, is that what it, that is? It looks like a, yeah, it looks like a rock wall, basically all different levels. So we get the diffusion the breakup of sound, and then on top of it, the absorption as well. That's great, man. That's and then the good. opposite side is, you know, glass doors. Uh, then this wall over here is just broken up panels. And then this wall back here is the glass to the control cool. room. Wow, yeah, you did a great job. I love it. Looks great. Well, thank you. Thank you. It took, it, it took a lot. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to jump in. And here, you know, uh, uh, Reference was saying something about somebody walking in with a big personality and saying, look at me, look at me. No, <laughs> so I, I just saw, I saw that. I saw that wall. And that's the first thing I was going to ask you for, you know, for anybody that doesn't know. And I think somebody else chimed off already. Like Audimute is uh, they're out of Cleveland. I think that's where Mitch lives. Yep. Cleveland, somewhere in Northern Ohio. And uh, if you start seeing a lot of these celebrity drummers, and I think he's a drummer also. Yes, he is. He's but a but uh, yeah, you'll start seeing a lot of those tracking rooms that, uh, you know, home session drummers are building. And it looks like they've got all these different stone or wood stuff. And that's all actually like a variety of acoustic product that has a great aesthetic and it, 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 did his did his team come out to you and build and, and design it or is that remote? no he i actually i purchased it i did the whole install okay myself i but i did send them the specs of the room i said this is what you're going to need and sure enough i mean as soon as i put it in my sound became the best way i could describe it is real focused so yeah. you don't get a sound that like is super absorbed but very very focused so whenever you record anything it just feels like it, the mic is capturing just that kind of thing. Yeah, those, um, I think I showed a couple of weeks ago, those, those uh, uh, this, they call them the, the, the sound sheets that they have, that they're the, the four yes. foot by eight foot. I have a bunch of those that I've used for remote recordings. Oh. And I even, I, I bought these little, um, uh, they're like maybe six, six and a half or seven foot um, garment carts like from amazon like four wheels and it's got a frame and then there's a middle part and i've been able to i can either hang them over that and create like tall gobos or i can have a short one which are about four foot and i just fold the blanket over it and it's it's really thick and i've done it with like live amps in a room and it it does everything that like a big heavy wooden gobo would do but then i can fold them up and put them away or throw them in a truck and go do a remote recording with them. And, uh, yeah, they, mm. they, they make such good stuff, you know? Wow. Yeah. Anyway. So, <laughs> so I can get everybody's name here. So we have Christian. I can see to my, this side over here, I, your name, Rob sound beats, Rob. Rob. Mm -hmm. And then references Brian, since he's Paul Brian. So <laughs> Rob, Brian and Christian. All right. Now I know everybody's name. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm like, thank you, thank you for joining too. Like, I, I, I joined a few of your lives now, man, and like plethora of knowledge, like killer sound, like obviously, like your, your gear and studio is amazing. So super cool. <laughs> <idea. laughs> Listen, I look at your guys' stuff, and I'm going, what am I even doing in this industry anymore? Like, I'm, you know, about ready to be fifty, and and like I've I've been doing it forever, but like, what am I even doing? I watch all your guys' stuff and hear your guys' stuff, and I'm just like, I, I still got to keep learning. Got to keep pushing you know, through. It's the best thing about our industry, I think, is that, like, there's no ceiling in any regards right. in terms of education, learning, getting better. 
advancing the business, you know, working with more people. Like that's what I love about it. It's just keeps you alive, keeps you young. Well, yeah, especially as genres change and evolve and all that kind of stuff. You know, you're constantly learning. How do I treat this? How do I, you know, how do I come about that? You know, so it's yeah, it's it's an industry that never, you know, that never is just stagnant. It's I, I, you're I constantly so. learning. You know, we did get a, a question that I saw down here. Okay. Um, and maybe we could kind of unpack this a bit. I think a lot of people struggle with this. Um, but Ali says, if an artist is struggling with a mix from their producer, how do they tell them? I think this is a really important conversation, to be honest. <laughs> Oof, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're not liking it, um, I think my opinion, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in. Uh, I because I just had this happen. Now I wasn't a producer; I was the mix engineer on a project, and uh, the artist that I was working. Matter of fact, the mix that I was working on, he, uh, you know, I had made a decision of using a uh, tuned vocal, uh, an, a, a vocal that was raw, and I tuned the vocal I'm where sorry, I felt one, really. One second, yeah. uh, Brian, would you mind? Yeah. Thank, thank you. All right, my my apologies. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so I decided to use a raw track and then I decided to pitch correct and stuff like that, where I felt that it sat better. But the artist flat out told me, he said, listen, man, you know, and this is how I started the conversation with him. I said, listen, if there's anything you don't like, you got to tell me, because at the end of the day, it's about you being happy. It's about you being happy with the product. And he came back to me and said, listen, I want you to use the, the, the vocal that I tuned. And I said, great. You know, and that's that's basically what you hire us as audio engineers, as producers, is to, you know, give a perspective, at least my thought, to give a perspective, to give a thought of how a, a mix should be or how a product should be. But at the end of the day, you're the artist. You're the one that's going to have to go out and tour on it. You're the one that's going to have to try to promote the album, that type of stuff. So that's just my thought. I, I would say just talk to your producer. I like it. I like it. Do you have any thoughts to share on this, Christian? I would co-produce the track. <laughs> so usually if I don't like something, I'll add something to it. Uh, of course, I will ask the producer if I may so. But uh, yeah, I will always give my honest opinion. If at the end of the day they want it as they is, then so it so be it. It's at the end of the day, it's not my my track, right? I'm just a mix engineer. So lately I mixed a track for... Um, two guys that uh, co-produced the, the track and they hired someone to do the vocal and she basically sang over the whole track. So there's not even two seconds in a track where you just, it's just instrumentals, it's just her voice. <laughs> even when it fades out and it, you know, you see the instrument going down, even there, there's a vocal coming in. And I told them, you know, I can mix the vocal if you want to, but it feels like, <laughs> you know, the vocal is everywhere. I would choose just a little bit of the vocal and yeah they they said the same thing so they are going back and um reviewing that but that's for an instance it just giving my honest opinion if they still want to go with what they had planned it's fine by me yeah i, th I think it's important what you said isaac is um you know just having that conversation with them and and, and the, i think there's always this point where there's feelings involved and we got to kind of <clears> take that out of the equation and there's one person that kind of is the <laughs> overseer, the boss of the project, and that's the client, you know. And so, Ali, if 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 that's your project, that's your track. Like, I know it's a hard conversation that could be your friend or whatever, but you know, maybe be just open with them. Say, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings or anything, but like, th this isn't the direction I wanted to go in. You know, can we approach it in in a different way or so, you know, some some form of that where. It's not about the feelings at this point. It's just about serving the music and, and taking care of the client. How are you today, Tom? Welcome in. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks for alive. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> I'm just wondering what's the subject today? What is the... Uh, we were answering a question from Ali and it says, uh, if an artist is struggling with a mix from their producer, how do they tell them? <laughs> it's a tough question because like hey we, we all deal with it and um i mean i dealt with it on my end and i've also had people come to me and being like hey i don't like what you did and don't get me wrong i mean i think we all would agree there's times where we, we if we're sending off a mix we're happy with it right oh, yeah. and then when 
comes back, they're like, no, I'm not happy with it. It's, it's an ego, you know, it's, it, kind of, it kind of messes with your ego a little bit, but it, yeah. if we could push those feelings aside, you know, and, and understand we're here to serve the music. Like, I think that that's like the ultimate thing in my head. I'm, and, and just what Isaac said, like, if you're dealing with the client, you know, ultimately it's their decision. So I usually put my feelings aside and I'm, you know, whatever you need, I'll take care of you. Yeah. You know, one of the things to, uh, I would always recommend to sort of the artist, you know, and if you're dealing with a producer and sometimes it's that the producer mixer kind of person, but whatever the, the role is. And Rob, you said, it right, like, there's a lot of emotion always that it's music, you know, it's, it's going to be emotional. However, you know, having your own professionalism because it's like you know if you're recording something just to record it for your art and your feels that's one thing but if you're planning on making a commercial product then you know put just put your professional hat on be direct be you know respectful of each other and but be specific and helpful you know from a person so the more that you can sort of like whittle it down and and say yeah there's something like the vocal is not prominent or there's too much guitar or it doesn't have enough rhythmic impact something along those lines that give your mixer uh you know a hint as to what you want and hopefully uh then they're like oh yeah totally you know we'll we'll address that specific thing and hopefully it works out and then the same thing for the mixers that would receive that type of feedback uh yeah hey it's what the client wants so just do it um but <laughs> do it in a way that you know, it makes musical sense and doesn't create other problems down the road, you know. But yeah, I think a lot of times you'll have artists, though, that they don't know what they want. And often it's they actually don't like their own song. <laughs> so they'll just keep coming to you with something else that, you know, it's like, it's like you know, it's a tune. Sometimes it's OK. You can totally scrap a track. You don't have to force it into being done. If it's like, you know what, I recorded this. Nothing that I do, I like. And uh, we're just going to table it for a while. I don't know. That, that, that's what I would, add, you know, add to any of that. Just like be specific and direct about what are the changes you want your mixer to do. Yeah, I agree. I think that this is um, kind of coattail on that. I think it's interesting because it gets a little subjective sometimes. Like my idea of bright is totally different than another person's idea of bright. And I run into this often. Like, can you brighten that up? I'm like, I did. It's like super bright, <laughs> you know. And and so we we get into those weeds a lot. And may, maybe there's something I could say to artists out there too that I deal with often. And that, and that's like comparing yourself to other artists. Can you get me to sound like this and sound like that? And uh, I think there's that, that this gets into dangerous territory, so to speak. You know, because you're not them first and foremost, and then. We could break down gear and how they got to that town and so on and so forth. And so there's so many factors that are going to like be challenging to get to that. Um, but ultimately understanding that, like, how does the record sound instead of comparing, you know, if, if, if you could at least close your eyes and try to think of yourself as a listener and not be the artist and not be overcritical of your voice and overcritical of the project, but close your eyes and to, like maybe just put it in the background, clean the house, let the song play. How does it sound and feel then? And usually when I do this to myself, I can get out of my head of like, ah, you know, maybe maybe I should EQ the kick at 200 hertz, you know, and just do all the like real technical stuff when, you know, most of the time it isn't necessary. I think it's more important the overall picture sometimes <clears throat> rather than just some specific thing from a mix, like just to feel the overall picture. And if it's good, Get it, get it. Don't touch it. <laughs> Leave it alone. It's so important I mean, right there. I mean, I had one client that was, uh, you know, it was a pop punk band. And we went through 15 different mix provisions. Wow. And, <laughs> to, to, and I'm going to be honest. I mean, I was a little, I was a little perturbed. <laughs> 
to be that far into it, but we were moving things like 0.5 decibels kind of thing, like where most people would not be able to tell the difference that, you know, that it was even moved kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he was happy. Now, what I did have to do to him is I said, listen, go back and listen to the first three, four mixes and see how close we were then. And it was kind of that psychology thing, you know, where you're you're going in, you're just like minutely just kind of doing this little, you're doing these minutia movements that are not making a bit, you know, making an adjustment to the bigger picture. But when they went back and actually listened to the first couple mixes, they were like, yeah, it just felt more right towards the beginning. We've gotten really clinical, whereas this felt more like a gut, you know, a gut mix. Like it was, that was it. And if we can just take some of the things that we were starting to do that was minuscule, you know, minuscule in the other mixes and just kind of apply just a little bit of that stuff, we're there. So 15, 16 revisions, whatever it was, you know, but we ended up with like mix three or four mm. with just minor, minor adjustments. Yeah, this is so important. I, um, I talk to my artists a lot about this, but I usually say when I'm getting into four or five, six, we're, we're, we're walking backwards at this point yep. <clears throat> because I think you would all agree that we get into a flow state, especially when we first do the first initial mix, you get it, you really get attached to how it, the relationships of everything. Yep. And it's hard to get back into that, especially when we're like four five, six, seven mixes. Like I've already worked on this this many times and, and you kind of fallen out of that pocket and the, it, right. maybe the motivation, the feeling, all of that isn't the same at that point. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I try to nail those mixes like within three revisions, if, if any, you know, um, yeah. usually yeah. Mix typically the three, you know, three is like my, my, my magic number, you know, because the first one is my, my, like you said, the first mix, when you pr present the first mix, is kind of like, hey, this is how I felt. All these things should work together. Second mix is like, okay, the collaborating with the artist, kind of saying, maybe add this, that. Third mix is the final touches kind of thing. But when we got, and that was that was earlier on in my career when I was doing that. And I just kind of was like, look, bro, you got to, we got to look at these other mixes again. And it was just, it was, yeah, it was tough. <laughs> I literally, through that like because probably at that point, you're getting you're getting the, the the email the mix revisions and you're just no feeling no emotion you're literally just going through okay i'm gonna do that i'll do that there was no heart back into making those adjustments it was just being extremely clinical yep exactly and and it's funny that you say that i've, I've dealt with the same thing I, I think we did 10 revisions and ended up going with the first mix <laughs> and like you know it is what it is. I'm willing to always like, if we could get better, why not try? I'm, I, right. I definitely yeah. walk with that mentality. Right. But like, I was really frustrated leaving that project. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to work with you again. I'm just going to keep it real. <laughs> like, like if that's what this is going to be, like, I don't know if it's worth the headache at that point. You know, like I, I feel like I just wasted, you know, two days of my time revise, you know, going back, re revise, revise, just to pick the original, you know, it's come on, what are we doing to our head here? You know, it's a, it's this trickery we get in with um, this perfectionism, you know, <laughs> like I, it's, the mix has to be perfect. Mix has to be perfect. And it's, um, uh, that's such a, like, uh, that's a, a, a very delicate line to walk, you know? Yeah. Hey, Christian, I saw that you're going to have to, I'm going to have to leave in about 30 minutes as well. I have a session, uh, classical guitar, I'm recording a classical guitar today. So Christian, oh, please, man, jump in, Do, throw some... I know Christian. Well, I, want, I, want to, I want to hear you talk, bro. I want to see the new gear that you got. Me too. Me too. <laughs> it's not the new gear. It's the same that Rob has, but I wanted as well because I saw it on Rob's desk and I want that piece of gear as well. So <laughs> he made me jealous. Uh, I had to wait three <laughs> weeks. wasn't a good influence on you. <laughs> yeah, no. Rob that. is not a good influence for my budget. <laughs> Definitely not a good influence for my budget. <laughs> What do you got in your Let's savings? See. Let's spend it. I think yeah, your wife uh... hates Rob. Your wife hates him. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, wifey. I'm That's sorry. a big fan. <laughs> uh, yeah, there it is. Um, wow. You know what? I'm going to just take this off from this stand. So I got a big six, and the way I cable it, because I kind of you know, change the way it's um, meant to be <laughs> in a way. Uh, the inserts, uh, the one and two, I map them in the patch bay and from the patch bay they are hard, -wired, so they are in normal and they are, the first one goes to the CLA-2A and the other one goes to the 1176 and the other three and four goes to the stereo 
one and two of the drama uh, compressor. Uh, mm -hmm. Also through the uh, patch bay. So basically, I can actually root the vocals or the kick or the bass and side ch and chain them both together mm -hmm. at the same time or even uh, through the drama. So I did that. And um, on the cues, on the stereo cues, I have map. I'm going out from the stereo cues to the pedal board, which is the Big Sky and the UAD, but also through the patch bay, so I can re reroute them as I want to. And then I'm coming in on external one and two back. Uh, and you know, you have the buzz B, and that's the, the last thing I did. The when I'm clicking the buzz B, it also goes out in the patch bay, but it's also hardwired to my Tegla stereo compressor oh and pull tag EQ. And it comes back to the sum it up also in the back and before the compressor. So basically when you're doing drums, I can bring the drums here, put them on sum B, get them compressed there, and then getting <laughs> them back before the compress the final mix, all analog. And mm -hmm. you can also read, and also in the patch bay, I did, the team machine, the boss, oh also gosh. in the patch bay, but through the Apollo. And that means actually that I can go from bus B to the Tegla, to the tape machine, and then come back. <laughs> and all analog. I was going to ask you that, dude. Did you hook up the tape machine to the, to the <laughs> parallel? Yeah, dude, everything so is patch bay. It's Wait, but I see a all... fusion there. What's, what's the fusion doing? Yeah, Where's, and then the fusion there is line? an insert at the end of it. Uh -huh. This insert goes out to the fusion and comes back <laughs> after. Uh, and the wow. way, because I wanted to do it like this. I want to click the, you know, the bus B and then do the mix as a, you know, as a pearl mix and going out to this one or leave it as it is and go through the G bus or select which one I want to glue with this one and then go out through the G bus. My gosh, that is that is amazing. It is. It took it me is. three days to figure it out all out, but you know, <laughs> I'm still trying to like it's amazing. process it. <laughs> uh, the way I I did the synthy, so I have the Moog sub, the the Prophet, and the Mini Moog. So here's just in case nobody, yeah, that's the Mini Moog oh. there. So the Mini Moog comes on channel one, the sub comes on channel two, on three comes the grandmother which is here now behind me and on four is the mother th th 32 and then wow. on five and six i have the prophet on uh seven and eight i have the oberheim on nine and ten i have the hydra which is up here and then on 11 and 12 i have the roland boutique one which is the that's roland j something um yeah that's pretty much it how i have it wired and um the apollo and the twin are in chain with the focus ride and the evo in uh, adat mod and the preamp is also connected to that so i can also put that on a channel separately to the console how did you clock the apollo to the big six uh yeah good i thought you're gonna ask that <laughs> the only way you can do it is by give me one second I need to open something so I'm gonna show you here on the on this one so basically I put a universal audio as the master and this is the clock it also has the clock and the big six I put it in drift correction so I made an aggregate device which is called UAD SSL which combines the Apollo and the Big Six in one unit. So, so I'm not so I'm not monitoring from this one. So it's bypassing this one. It's That's coming out from this Your one. Apollo. And this yeah. one has two outputs. The first output goes out into my um, Palmer preamp for my headphones, which I put the audis in. And from that one, it goes into the sub. And from the sub, it goes into the satellites from the EVE. And the alternative one goes out from here. It goes into an amplifier and it goes to the NS10s. 
Bro. Dude, you're, like, you're like a mad scientist. With I was going to say, like, that's oh. genius, man. <laughs> like, yeah. Tell me about it. I, I spent like a lot of hours thinking about it. How yeah. I best make the make, make the best out of the console because I wanted actually to get the whole mix analog out, not to have any plugin at the end of the day. Yeah. How many inserts are available on the Big Six? On the Big Six, you have sixteen. Uh, yeah, sixteen inserts. Uh, also, fifteen and sixteen are your outs. So fifteen and sixteen is your external in, but it's also your out. So in and out, basically. But sixteen Interesting. works both ways. Yeah. No? I was thinking, yeah. Uh, yeah, for anybody that's out there that's like thinking about, you know, doing some stuff with analog gear, and like one of the things that you can also do via inserts, because insert will work as a send and return. Yeah. But you can also use inserts just as a send. So if you want to do your processing through the console and then you want to ultimately record those process tracks, uh, whether or not you're doing an archival or you just want to free up the free up the desk, you're, you've committed what you want. You can use those insert points just going yeah, that's out what... like you, you like you'd use them as a direct out and then track that into another 16 channels or whatever you're using in the DAW. And then you free up those channels because you've already done all your routing and your processing and, you know, old the only school hard, tricks. Yeah. Yeah. The only hard wiring which I have is this insert, which goes to the fusion and back. Every other insert that I have here, including the Q points, they're all patch paid. So it doesn't matter how I want to combine. I can combine however I want the tape machine, the pedals there. I also have the Chase Bliss here up so I can combine them as I wish. I can put them on stereo attack, on the stereo cues. I can also put them on inserts. Yeah, but they are hard. A... But the way they are, you know, without any cabling, the way it is, is just on the inserts are the are the compressors and the, on the synth cues are the, the effects. However, you can put them however you want in patch bay. Uh, the, the hardest thing was figuring out the sum B, but because the B bus mutes your channel it, it gets your channel out right and i figured out there is still the summit up which basically people use to bring the six console in as a submix so mm. what i thought about it it would be great to have then the samba saying i have i saw this on your uh, channel uh, actually that the idea it was inspired from you isaac because you bust the drums with the bass yes right so yeah. that what was what I figured out. I can take the bass on four, the uh, drums from here, put them in in bass in bus B, get them right. glued in here, yep. and get then bring them go. back as a submix. <laughs> but keeping it all analog. Yeah, which is it, oh. that's wow. that's so great. To, just to really, I'm so glad you're doing this and, and talking about, you know, where people kind of think that. Oh, analog, that's so backwards compared to what you can do today. There's so much routing in, in SSL as we had our commercial for SSL last week, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but it's they've been one of the really always on the forefront of creative ways of routing. And even in their small format uh, consoles like the like the big six, I mean, you know, n normally like, if you, you would get a duality or a, you know a, a, an old like 9k or something you have like three stereo sub masters yeah. and api the uh the visions and that they've got and a lot of those big consoles they'll have like stereo a stereo b stereo c where you can sort of route your groups to that and then put those into the 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 master you know left right out but you're doing that on a small format console. I mean, you can use the auxes, you can use exactly. you know, your bus B, you can use your, your control room monitor outs. It's all line level and just routing, you know, picking and choosing, yep. you can parallel process uh, and you're not using any plug-in horsepower. You know. Exactly, exactly. You don't have to worry about the only, only thing either. that you're... Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's the huge part. <laughs> But the idea is, you know, to somehow in Pro Tools, when I'm getting down the mix down, to get every bus to these channels. And then from that point on, I'm all analog until I'm back into the, the final mix. You know, I'm bringing that back uh, into the uh, door. 
Um, just, yeah, you were saying so, that, so you you're I'm sorry, you, you're going the SS so your your clock your aggregate device is the SSL yeah. to the Apollo. Nope. Yeah. Or, yeah. And yeah. then so but you're also the going ADAT to your you have an audience or a focus right or, both or something like that so, as well. Uh, yeah, I can explain that. Uh, okay, one, so um, that's all one sure. big chain, right? Yeah. So those so are getting clocked basically ADAT the, through. So the the Apollo it's, Twin is with USB C uh, chained to the Apollo because there's. It, uh, so Apollo sees this as one unit. So actually, it sees there are two units, but you know you don't need a that for that. It's all USB, right? Between this and this okay. one. Okay. Then the Apollo is through a that to this one. But since the Apollo has only ins, I can only use the ins from this one, not the outs, right? And so I get only the preamps, and that's it. So this one is connected to this one, and the Apollo has ins and outs. So this one is connected in and out through ADAT to the EVO SP8. So basically this one, this one, this one, and this one is just one unit. And this is aggregated with this unit. So I have almost 54 channels to my availability. Wow. With a small setup like this, you know? That's a really brilliant plan, man. That's like, you know, th th this kind of, kind of, even though you bought new gear, it's like it, it sort of flies a bit in the face of well i gotta i gotta upgrade i gotta keep upgrading and buy more and more and more and more stuff i mean you're completely leveraging in probably even in some ways beyond really what any some of the manufacturers would think about <laughs> but it's like yeah you've got all this stuff that are relatively lower cost units and now you're at 54. that's uh, yeah. that's pretty awesome and the, the idea the patch bay saves me because the patch bay basically has all the other compressors in there and I can change them as I want. That was a, a headache because, you know, um, the way I did, I can ex explain shortly this, the way I made the patch bay work so I don't forget about it. I also wrote it here, but uh, can you hear me, guys? Yeah, yeah. Am I yeah, okay. So what I did is I'm coming, I'm coming from up to down, right? So, for example, here I'm coming out insert one from the SSL and going into the first compressor, coming out from the first compressor, going back into insert one, then coming out from insert two, going in the second compressor, coming out from the second compressor and going back to SSL, right? So everything it's like mapped, so it's figured out, so it's easy to remember, but I also write, wrote it here anyways. And then the same way goes through the board and since this one only has two Q, stereo Q outputs and this inserts, I still was left out with the bus uh, pedal that had no connection. I was left out with the tape machine that had no connection. And I was also left out, I think, with, uh, with this one. Everything else was in the patch bay. So that's why I thought, okay, I'm gonna put the tape machine through the Evo 8 because I love the preamps in this one and also the bus is also connected to this one. And this is also patch paid in here. So you can use those two independently of this one. So I can put, you know, a plugin and insert in Pro Tools and have them used as an insert in Pro Tools without touching the board itself. But you can also tie it up to the board because it's, you know, it's the patch pay. You can use it as you want. Wow. Genius, dude. Genius. You know, this thank you. I appreciate it, guys. It's like this is the gear, the gear stuff that you know you don't get to talk about with a lot of your your artists or the bands that you're with. They they could care less what you have or how you you know mad scientist wired it all together. But like Christian, wow, bro! Like that. Is... Yeah, hats off to you, dude. Like um, I'm a little jealous because I had a I had a merging Anubis uh, interface. Freaking yeah. love, by the way. If if y'all don't know if if y'all aren't aware of that interface, like high end preamps, it goes to like um, I think it's like three eighty four, something like that. It's it's like you know has high end converters in it and whatnot. I couldn't get it to clock to my big six, so I sold it. And now I'm like, dang it! Like he did you it. Don't have to play. <laughs> Maybe I probably could have made it work. Now that I think about it, and yeah, yeah, man, we have to agree. Dude. So. Every people, so I read a lot of uh, forms uh, and uh, what people are saying. 
the best way to connect is in a drift mode if you don't want to use the serial out. So, you, you know, like analog get out from your SSL. Uh, but you're going to get latency when you're tracking. That's for sure. So uh, I'm not expecting any real time uh, tracking, but I don't really care because I'm tracking just since, right? And the scenes are going in there and I'm playing anyways, MIDI take uh, stuff through it. So I'm just going to take care. So I'm shifting them a little bit uh, right or left. Doesn't matter. I have time to, so there's no pressure. Uh, you, but you cannot, you, you cannot avoid the latency. That's, that's it. Do you deal with um, the audio dropping off at all? Until now on the test that I did? Nope. It didn't drop off. Mm. That's the so, issue. Like, I got I got it all to connect, but like I would get like three quarters of the way done with the track, and the audio would just slowly turn down. And, the, and I'm like, it's a clock. I had a loop. So I had a loop running for like I think at least ten minutes. It didn't drop off. Mm. Man, you didn't genius. get into. Man, I'm not a genius. I just wrote. I, I just read a lot of documentation. I had yeah, my, but even the, the bro, manual even in front hearing of hearing you explain it, I'm still trying to like process it like it's too <laughs> like it, it was like, like 11, do i even know like, what i know like am i really should i even so be it was, in I think it was like 10 o'clock in germany and i was like you know mapping with the pen and i was like this signal goes from here to here but if i want to map it like that it doesn't go okay screw that start from the beginning i need to map this with this uh so yeah it was like I, it, it took me at least two hours just to figure out how i want to patch it Mix then, pet says, uh, "How do you stop the humming?" That's, yeah, that's, that's exactly. I was just laughing at that too. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was uh, kind of like, a, you know, hey, buddy, Roy, thanks for the, the roses, man. I really appreciate it. I started, I think, around uh, Saturday, three o'clock, and I finished yesterday. Mm. So, yeah, it took me like a while to figure it all out. Sure, yeah, but so, yeah, you know, in terms of the real to real. You have that yep. going through the stereo queue, and you could do it in parallel. Nope, nope, nope. nope. So, Are you doing that? <laughs> nope. This is yeah, the one gonna... that I'm curious on because yeah. I'm actually so, going to do this in the future. So the the it's going out from up from my Evo eight from okay. uh, output three and four. It's going into my tape machine. It's coming up out from my tape machine, and it's going back to three and four inputs, but. It's not hardwired to Evo. It's going through the patch bay. So mm. my tape machine comes, I think, on 16 and 15. Oh, no. Yeah, 16 and 15 comes the tape machine. Uh, no, it goes out. Sorry. It goes out uh, from Evo. It goes to... So 3, 4 from Evo goes to 15 and 16, right? So right. here you have the... From your door, right? Okay. So the signal comes here out. Then it goes in... 39 and 40 to the tape machine then it comes out on 13 and 14 from tape machine out and it goes here in 37 and 38 to 3 and 4 back to evo <laughs> so that means you can have it as an insert in your pro tools but since it's in the same page bay for god's sake i can also say for my insert this insert which is you know either this one or this one or which one i have here go through the tape machine i'm cutting the you know the out from the evo so i'm getting into the tape machine and then coming back so it's wow. also for pro tools but also and the same applies to the, all the pedals so they are connected to these ones but they are all patch paid oh man yeah i bet it sounds amazing yeah yeah this is, this yeah, is probably oh, sorry, if you're running all that wire uh, I have like I think I so I bought just yesterday one kilogram of wires just to patch <laughs> the last remaining things. <laughs> so yeah, you know uh, it, I have like so, something we we yeah. should maybe like just hip people to that are that are you know watching and listening is you know what in, in Pro Tools and in some other DAWs they're talking about is the the aggregate I/O where normally you'd be running a single interface and even if that single interface may be connected via ADAT to another interface it's still treating it as one one single clock source in and out maintaining the sync 
and the 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 doing the aggregate so if you ever look in your pro tool session into the playback engine if you're ever like trying to change buffer size but there's also where you can pick the playback and if you're not using an interface then you can just run it out speakers or whatever you might be doing but you'll see that there has those aggregate io options and this is when you're combining multiple ios that aren't necessarily linked to each other which you were saying that you were, you you you've, you've got the clocking working with a little drift offset but in playback you're not really experiencing too much drift but in tracking that's where the drift happens is that that's accurate? what i said you can you yeah. cannot get away from that and that's the thing that's like uh, as a caution to people out there thinking like oh i could buy another interface to to get more channels to record and then you know you create an aggregate device of your three or four things and then you're doing uh let's say a drum set multiple microphones on a single source you, you might end up though with weird latency and drift which could create issues for the player at the time so just something like this is all awesome to put it together but like anything else there's always the uh uh challenges fine, that will, can the, come the along with tunes. that yeah which is you the know only that, way, that's one of the oh god the yeah. only way you can get around it is to hardwire it so the to get the monitor out into an input of the interface of the pole that's the next thing i'm gonna do but i i'm out of wire so i also want to take the <laughs> yeah. main out and bring it in a polo on a separate channel but i had no more cables so until now yeah. this is it uh, and for my electronic music producing it's more than enough and if you're doing like um, mixing, you don't have that problem. Yeah. So the problem only comes when you're tracking. And tracking, I'm not doing with Apollo. I, I'm doing just with the Big Six. So you're not tied up to Apollo for tracking, because I'm patch. I'm all the pedals and all everything I have on Apollo tied up. It's patch paid. So I can go into patch pay and use it in the SSL as well. So I don't have. It is a problem, but I solved it. So yeah. I'm not facing the problem. It's kind of, and if that problem. makes sense. And another problem, what was, and I forgot to explain, is if you're using an Apollo, in UAD console, you can only, you can choose the Pro Tools template, right? The problem is, what I was facing, I was loading up Logic Pro, and it worked perfectly. So I could use UAD and the SSL, right? No problem. I can put it on the output of the Super Analog and or whatever I wanted. But when I open Pro Tools, there was no signal coming in Pro Tools uh, from Pro Tools into my SSL. So then I remembered that the template in UAD has a 64 channel template. So it will consume 64 channel. So when you aggregate it with Big Six, you don't have 64. You have actually 70 something, right? So you're above 64. So when you bring Pro Tools, Pro Tools says your license for studio is just 64. So it will show you the channel, but it will not give you the audio out. So I had to go back to UAD, remove the template, create my own template by putting only the channel that I really have, and then it worked. Mm. Man. Gotta love that stuff. That's the stuff where you got it. Like this is the beauty of engineers is because yeah. none of us have the same setup and it all requires some sort of ingenuity, <laughs> if you will, you know, to, yeah. to get it to work. And like, yeah, that's it's super cool that you figured it out. Fun fact about the big six too, and I don't know if you know this, Christian, but you can buy a second one and you could connect them back to back to have 32 channels. And they both plug in USB C. So, like, you know, if you got Apple, you got two USB C's, you plug yeah. them in. So, if you need more channels, you could do it. <laughs> man, I don't have any space, man. I, I'm already <laughs> at the limit. Here. I know your wife's going to kill me. She's like, shut up. Yeah. And, and also, my bank account is crying for God's sake. So, no, it's more than enough. I rocket science the hell out of it. What yeah, I you right now. I'm surprised you figured all that out, man. Like, I mean, at this point, I'm really like I, I have a solid workflow on mine, you know, and I'm, I'm very happy with it. But like listening to you, how you routed it, I wish I spent more time when I had my Anubis. I, would, I wish I just spent more time with it and, you know, didn't I, I kind of gave up. It was it was Dante Connection, too. And that was a whole other thing about the Anubis. When you get into Dante Connection, mm -hmm. it's like ah, that melts my mind. 
it's like coding. The, <laughs> you know, but yeah. The thing is, uh, when I got it, the question when I put it on the table, I could only put some of the things in it because I didn't want to rewire the whole studio because I didn't have the patch bay the same way I did it right now. So the question was, either I take the time and do it right and I can, you know, get the most out of this console or just use it like 20% out of it. And when you spend so much money on gear, I cannot sleep at night knowing I'm only using 20% out of it. So <laughs> I basically took everything out of the studio. It was all cables. I showed it to Tom. So it was not, not just a table remained, just a table in the studio. And I brought every piece of gear one by one back. Wow. And I wired each one one by one back. So all that's from the way to that's the way to do it. I just replaced a bunch of older cabling in my in my patch bay. I've got two 96 point patch bays. So so it's a lot. So I got like 192 of patch bay and it's nearly all full. You'd be so surprised that like, you know, you oh, I don't have that much gear, but when you put everything into a, a point so you have that routing flexibility, it, it's a ton of stuff and I ended up like frustrated because, you know, maybe some cable OCD or something, but yeah, pulling everything out and just laying stuff in the, in, in a way that it makes sense. And, you know, if anybody out there is like installing stuff, just take your time, find the correct cable runs because when you need to actually change something or you decide why, but you, you would want to move it, never move anything. <laughs> But like, if you, you'll look at all the cabling and it's a hot mess, and you're like, yeah. uh, "Where's the?" Or you just want to, uh, maybe you have to get a speaker repaired, and you can't find out which of your uh, IEC cables is the actual left monitor to, you know, because <laughs> it's all buried. So yeah, lay, take all that stuff out and just lay it in neatly. Get everything cabled, you know. Lay that stuff in first. You know, get your label maker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's there, there always, always that, helps that in the Christian long run. Said, there was something that Christian said about you know he he drew it out, and literally when I was putting yes. my studio together, drawing it out really really did help so that you understand you understand where everything is going and how the cables are routed and stuff like that. But yeah, labeling all your cables, ins, outs, power, all that kind of stuff is vital. When you're like you're saying, when you're getting ready to do a repair, at least you know exactly where it is, but. Uh, having that, even having that schematic of the layout of where everything's patched in really helps out as well. Just want to say is, something. Oh, yeah, Just want to say one more thing. Uh, that's not cable management, if you ask me. <laughs> that's shit. And, you know, if you're going to ask me which is which, <laughs> only God knows. <laughs> now, that's the thing. He's like, where's you that home so coming from? What cable is that? Yeah. <laughs> forget about it so i just want to show that just in case people think everything is nice and tied up no nope, it's not if you're, at, if you're if it putting was, your hand on a tape really, on a cable, really bad bro i was gonna be real mad <laughs> if you're touching a cable please don't take it out <laughs> i don't know what that that does <laughs> so i just know what the front does but the back only god knows you know so yeah. Yeah. We'll cover that up and not, not, not think about it again. <laughs> yeah. So cable management, not really my strong point. So I just wired them. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, Rob. Yes, sir. Do you remember? So when we were talking with HB, this is maybe two or three weeks ago, and talking about some of the stuff about younger engineers and things like that, to where I know what we're talking about now for anybody listening – might seem like it's complicated, but all of these things are about the the basic. It's like, you know, before, instead of learning all the stuff necessarily with a plug in and all that, like this is basic signal flow that we're talking about and understanding those things of like what makes a young engineer more successful is you don't have to know exactly how they built the capacitor in inside of a, a piece of gear, but understanding essentially how the stuff is put together how it's wired and so when there is a problem that comes up in the studio or on a tracking session you're not guessing and having the artist look at you like oh this guy doesn't know what he's doing it's like 
Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a hum. Okay, well, what causes a hum? Well, probably power going <laughs> over audio. You know, <laughs> some, something like that. Or something's mispatched or you're, you don't have it routed. Oh, it's because the mute button is on. I mean, these little things that... Uh, the ground wire inside the quarter inch is, is loose. Yeah, <laughs> and that's... Well, I mean, out. geez, all, every <laughs> one of these things can be a complete episode. We could talk forever about just how to do a patch bay normal half normal not normal that's 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 a that's a week of discussion you know like i just had an issue with a guitar player and and like ground loops you know that kind of a thing and i you know fixing those you know there's all kinds of little things that we'll run into but just having that that basic understanding of how things work in an analog world will help you immensely in, in the digital world and like when people think oh i'm in the box i don't have to worry about this stuff it's like no you have digital patching yeah you don't yes. know it but you, there is a patch bay like all the inserts and sins those all have sins and returns and you can have them essentially normaled half normal not normal uh you know pre post all these things would be the same thing that you would deal with on an analog surface and so you're, you're never going to be um, in a situation where that knowledge isn't, I would say, mandatory to have. So this is just a really good example of, and it's not like you're a, a true mad scientist. This is all fairly basic patching 101, but you, you know exactly what you're doing and you've mastered the basics of it. That way you can leverage that piece of gear to... The, its maximum well, yeah, ability. Yeah, its potential. Yes. Uh, you get, so, say one more you thing get a, so I much more go. out of it. Yeah, I uh, totally agree with that. Uh, I just want to uh, jump in there because I need to leave. I will come back in 40 minutes if you're still live, Rob. Um, I just want to say the fact that if you buy this one and you put an insert here, you see this insert and this one, if you press, even if you don't press it, it will send the signal out into your compressor. So don't get scared. Only if you press the insert, it will Very bring good. it back. Yep. Because Very I good. got scared. I was like, I'm not pressing the insert, and he's not working. And yeah. My compressor is like going like nuts. And I was yeah. like, is it broken? Then I put every <laughs> insert, every insert did the same thing, and I was like, get to the manual. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> nah, the last thing I said. But uh, it was nice talking to you guys. Um, I'll need to jump off. I have a meeting, but uh, I'll rejoin if you're still here. If hey, not, then I see you next week. My, my clients yeah, for a session. Uh, so yeah. I'm Isaac, doing the same thing. I got an 11 o'clock hit. So you guys are right, awesome. All right, much love, y'all. Bye. Cheers. Yeah, it's it's you know like I loved what Brian was unpacking because I know when I approach a mix, I'm always thinking of how a console works digitally. You know, and so like I like to I'll start off with doing like tape, you know, and like getting a good like analog sound. If I'm doing a full digital mix, you know, throwing a, a studer on everything and letting that run through like I'm, you know, doing like a sort of a console like analog, you know, mix. And, and I like I when I look at a DAW, that's how I think of it. It's a console just in digital form. I love how I unpack that because that's what what it truly is. Yeah, I, but today, like. I would say nowadays, like people are getting into this um, sound engineering stuff. I don't know how to call it. Mainly, people are, are, are like more more likely to be producers when they just work around on a laptop or something. But sound engineering, it it's a bit something different. Not just like mixing or mastering something. Like it's a bit more technical. I would say. And a lot of people have this misconception, I would say that, oh, I'm a sound engineer if I mix something or mm. I do a master. And these basics, like these basics as a reference mix said, one-on-one patching and uh, insert, uh, uh, and all this stuff is, is really, really the basics of the basics. Uh, in this engineering world and it's it, it gets so complicated if you want to complicate it it gets so no. complicated <laughs> and it's different for us all that's what like i find the most interesting what's up will like even will's setup like 
he's got a crazy setup and <laughs> how he how he set his up versus mine versus you versus Kristen versus Brian like it's all different and I think that that's like that's the beautiful thing about our business is how we all figure out how what to make it work works for you yeah yeah uh, I, I agree um I I was only able to kind of come in on the tail end of what everybody was saying and whatnot um but yeah I fully agree man like it's and I, I remember I remember when me and Rob met years ago now and. I remember a lot of our conversations that we would have as a group was how a lot of younger engineers would always ask, well, how do you do this? And how do you do that? Because in their minds, they want to copy everything that they deem was successful on your part. Yeah. But the reality is it's the years of trial and error to get to that place where you're comfortable in what you do and what you produce and what leaves your hands. That's what makes the success more prominent. And that's why everyone's setup is it's like from a distance, everyone will say all of our setups look very similar. And it's until you get up close is when you see the differences. But all of our difference our our studios are really like parts of our personality. Mm, very yeah. true. Like when you look at someone's those, studio, those you're the looking at it. and everything. Exactly. <laughs> it, 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 look, look, I don't there is nothing more telling about a person's like personality than their studio because when you look at it when you step back and you look at it you get you know what you're looking at and who you're dealing with because like again, if, if it's look think about it if it's really uber technical and there's gear and stuff everywhere you know you're you're, you're dealing with an analytical en engineer but they might this might also be their personality into the rest of the world mm. I like and, that, man. And at the same time, if it's very scaled back, minimalistic, this might also be how they treat things in the in the real world when they deal with people. It's if these are our work environments. It's it's all telling. Yeah, I don't you, know. You said uh, somebody said a proverb like the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Everything, yes. So, <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, very, very true. I'm like, I'm just thinking about like how you're you, you unpack that well. Um, and thinking about like Dan and how like yep. how he set up and how true that is, and it reflects his personality and just a hundred percent deep about things. And you're you're absolutely correct, man. Like, and we all have like unique taste for our studios and whatnot. And then, like mm -hmm. I think of HB and how his studio set up. Yeah, and think about it. Yeah, person. dude, it's like. You, when you see someone's space that they that they put together themselves, even if it wasn't put together themselves, you can tell. It, it's like our studios are, are our rooms and how we decorate our rooms, both functionality and and like just the sheer you know magnitude of, of what it looks like. You get the sense of, again, who you're dealing with, the kind of person they are. You know what I mean? How, how things are moved, how things, again, how people perceive sound. Mm. You know what I mean? Because remember, these are all judgment decisions that we base off of both practical and like learned knowledge. Very true. So true, dude. <laughs> you know, so oh, it's, like, it's, yeah, yeah. it's very telling. Mm -hmm. Which is yes. always, which is always crazy because young engineers then like, so what did you do, and how did you do it? Why did you do it, and why did you put this here? Hey, everybody <laughs> just want to copy a preset and they expect it to work. And a lot of like a lot of guys ask me like, "Ah, oh, Tom, you should do a course or something." Like, man, you don't <laughs> need my course if 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 you if you have extra money, okay, I can accept it as a donation. <laughs> but uh, you just need like two books. Go through those books, like the basics, the basic oh, stuff. Good. Like the uh -huh. really good one is the Mixing Engineers Handbook, the fifth yes. edition. Love love updated to the new plugins and stuff even sue too is mentioned in the book and explained that one if you want some acoustics the master handbook of acoustics and mm -hmm. another one from bobby osinski i think or that they are just two or three books like reference books really good ones if you understand those you have a really good basic yeah foundation of Ooh, how I, I know the one that you're talking about from bobby the um the recording engineer's handbook yes the Ooh. recording engineer's Ooh, those are great books but today people they they don't have, tend to have the i don't know the mental capacity and the power the, you took the words right off <laughs> to go through yeah. the book it, it's 
it's really hard for them. And I had a conversation with a guy who said, like, uh, could you just help me out with some private lessons and something? And man, I just give you the book for free. No, 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 I don't want to book. I, I, I don't have time to read. I, I just want you to explain me the book. So th that's basically what he said. And I wow. gave him for free. Like, look, it is for free. You don't have to pay for it. It's a PDF. <laughs> just open it and read it. No, no, I just, I want you to explain it. I don't have time and space. You know what's to funny? Read. That same guy in the next five years, if he continues on, is going to end up reading that book anyway. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> because that's what, yeah, that's what happens all the time. It's like in our in our in our community, when the knowledge is open that way and everybody can access it, no the, the value of it decreases. But when you have to buy it or you you have to push yourself to learn it or to obtain the knowledge of your own volition, it's that's when you start to realize the weight of all the decisions you made before you got to this point. Like I like every I feel like this. Every engineer goes through the same trial by fire. It's like we've all spent thousands of dollars on plugins and gear that we a hundred percent regret. <laughs> X. <laughs> Instead, I should just open a book and just to properly. Okay, what am I using now? Yes, Is it necessary or it's completely just bullshit? because because it's funny because when you like when you when you get the uh, mixing engineer's handbook. Every plugin in that book that's even mentioned is actually a plugin that's either was it's like it was made within this these 20 year range and is still used in every studio to this day. Like mm. like Waves DSer, the entire R um bundle, like the Renaissance bundle is in every studio I have ever walked in. Sure. But these the L2? Are, you, you know what I mean? Like oh, the yeah. L2, the L1. <laughs> L1, I, yeah, every look, studio. Yep. Every. Stab filter Pro Q3 at this point. Like every studio, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But but that's the thing. I, I've learned you can look for alternatives, and there's some great alternatives. But getting the thing that yeah. that you say you want the first time eliminates a lot of want later on down the road. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's like if you say, I want a tube microphone. Okay, what kind of tube microphone? I want a 47. Okay, cool. Then go get the, go get it. Why, why are you buying FET microphones if you told me you want a tube 47? <laughs> <So true. laughs> because, so because someone told me I can get it close with, a, with this extra plug-in if I put the plug-in on there. It's like, but why? <laughs> It's, it's funny you see you're breaking all this down because I'm going back in my head and like building my studio, I knew what sound I wanted to go for. It was just like, what gear is going to get me there? That's the hard question to answer because there's definitely testing things out, right? And we got to leave room for that. But I'll never forget it. It was like, it was instant. Like HB called me one day and he's like, it's the big six. And he broke it down. I was like, that's exactly what I've been looking for for literally the past five years. And he didn't have to even, it, you don't have to sell it to me, dude. I already know that this is what I wanted. <laughs> and I was looking for it forever. And I th that was a specific sound I had in my head. I was like, I want a console or some form of console that would reflect that in my home studio, you know, yeah. without getting the big console. And I always knew that that's like the direction I wanted to head it. And, and I think that's kind of important to establish as an engineer, like you have it, you have a specific sound you kind of like in your head, right? Maybe you like colorful mixes, maybe you like bright mixes, maybe you like darker mixes, you know, like you could kind of break things down in those terms and that could somewhat, you know, get you to follow the right road to find the right gear to get there. And, and that's what it is. It's, otherwise, you're just going to get like just what you said. And, and this might be a rite of passage, but you're going to buy a lot of stuff that probably <laughs> is not going to work. <laughs> like, and it's like, yeah, I, I think I, I have a very short list of gear that was super, really like uber cheap that I still have that I know for a fact, if if the worst case scenario were ever to happen with all of my gear, I know for a fact I could always get back up with these like two or three key pieces because I've done it before. But those are far few in between, because again, yet you, you have to you have to go through that fire, because we all we all think, oh well, it's okay. And look, if such and such said they did it, I can do it. Literally throwing out all the years of experience, yep, <laughs> yep. and you all the rest saying? of the stuff that came along with it too. You know, you, yeah. you know what I mean. Completely throwing out any any manual reading, all of that. Like yeah. just if they did it, I can do it. And 
I never fault people for that because again, we all go through that. Sure. You know, like, dude, <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you how many engineers besides all of us right now, that if we have the conversation about how many useless plugins we've all bought and then stopped using the, the millions of dollars that the collective conversation would probably be talking about would be staggering probably. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I really don't. Ninety percent of my plugins are collecting dust, and you can't Dude. resell them. Come it, on, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, like plugin value, man. It's like I can only sell it for. You can only sell it for a quarter of what it, of what you what it was deemed to be worthy of or worth. And it's like. I'm not gonna lie, dude. It, it was one of the main. Remember when I was telling you? It's the reasons why I became a beta tester. I rather I rather test the plugin out, get it for free, yeah, yeah. instead of going yeah. and spending my <laughs> spending my money on another plugin, dude. Totally, it's like because yeah. it, plugins plugins at this at this stage of my career, I look at plugins like a like a fast car. But like now, it's like it's a fast. It's a new Honda. That's that's how I look at plugins. This is a new Honda. Like <laughs> it looks really pretty. It's super customizable. We can do whatever we want with it, but it's still a Honda. And I <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It, it, listen, it, it's not, it's never going to hold its value. And it hundred percent will get me from point A to point B. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's a Honda and I'm not in the market for a Honda anymore. <laughs> See, I've gotten good at that too. I'm like, no more EQs, no more compressors. I got too many of those things. Like, and, and, I'll say this. There was one plugin. It was that Verve plugin that just came out for free from UAD. Like oh, when I hear like saturators, it's free. Yeah. It's free though. Oh, man, it's free. Get those, you know, but when I hear like saturators, I was like, oh yeah, I could definitely get that. Right. Like some sort of like cool effects plugin or things like that. Like I'll maybe get interested <laughs> in something like that, but get out of here with those EQs and compressors. I'm good. I got, I got 80,000 reverbs. I'm okay. <laughs> like, you Ooh, know, what it, I mean? it took me, it took me talking to JL and HB. To, to finally, like, dude, when it first came out, I remember getting the HG2 black box plugin. I got it for, when it first came out, like, like it, it, it was on super sale. I got it for like 25 bucks. I've literally had it for the whole 10 plus years it's been, it's been out. Dude, I'm just now within this last year, fully utilizing it and using it to its fullest potential. And I'm just like, man, I missed a lot of time with this. And, and it solved my vocal saturation want. Interesting. Like, yeah. I, I I don't I want for nothing when it comes to vocal saturation now. It like like zero. And it's like this sucks because my whole career I've had this thing for like again ten plus years. And I'm twenty two years in. Half of my career, I'm like, damn, damn. I, I how many times did I look at this plug and going, I don't use this. I should sell it. We've all been there, dude. We've all been there. <laughs> you know what's funny? It's like um it's kind of side note, but uh Brian and I talk about this, like and we'll say like in the year 2000 saturation wasn't even a term because it just came from the gear yeah and it's just really like baffles my mind the more and more i think about it and like don't get me wrong like saturation's huge i love it and i understand color and like it's a massive part to mixing like mm -hmm. in fact like probably most of it but it's interesting to me how much of the you know it's at the forefront of all these conversations mm -hmm. but in 2000 we literally didn't talk about it it just was already in the gear yeah. Well, that's the so that's the thing. The I remember talking to my Sweetwater rep, and and because when we were all like first meeting each other, getting together, and I remember having that those conversations as well because harmonics was not a topic of discussion. I, I'll say this: this generation for engineers, and I I know I'm gonna sound like an old engineer, but I am, so I'm I'm, I'm gonna sound like it. Me too, bud. This this <laughs> this generation of engineers has it ridiculously easy easy because and, 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 I, and I'll, I'll break it down because number one the terms of the things that we do are perfectly defined now whereas 20 years ago they weren't and a lot now of our bigger engineers were, were using wrong terminology they they were not engineers in the true sense the lab coat the understanding of the internal workings of pieces of gear a lot of them were really just knob turners and fader pushers they hey this sounds really good i like it For radio because, you know what i mean yeah because they were musicians first engineers after and again no problem with that there is no issue with that but it, it lets you know at the turn of the engineering times that is is how they started to mature into the field so fast forward now, 
yeah, they they have plugins to solve the issues of what digital could not bring with it from the analog domain. Mm. So it's like when people go, what do you use as a clipper? I tell them, I don't use clippers. Well, why don't you use a clipper? Well, because I have a mastering converter. And what you could, what you call clipping is what we would do on that to get more gain out of the converters that we were using. So you have a plugin for it. I do it innately because that's how my setup is hooked up. You know what I mean? You, we're looking for saturation. We just pushed the gear. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like, we just we just pushed into the gear more to get saturation. Your plugins are folding up at like at least ten dB before my gear would fold up. Same problem, but it's just happening sooner in the digital domain before it happens in the analog domain. We can all get to the same. We can all get to the same goal. It's just going to sound slightly different. That's Very that's really the only that's really the only difference. You know, again, we're older engineers. I I like gear. I like turning knobs. I like pressing buttons. And there's a sound that is a familiarity as an engineer that I grew up on and that we hear in more modern music. And because, you know, our ears are a little more seasoned to the understandings and workings of, of modern music that gets released on a, on a major platform. Right. You know what I mean? Like I remember, I remember working at this um, indie studio in Baltimore and the engineer there, his name was Solomon. And I, he told me something that stuck with me my entire career. And I always told it to my interns and guys, when you start engineering, you have to be told and shown what a good sound is. You think you know, but I'm going to show you what a good sound really is and how to get it. And that's always stuck with me my entire career. We have to be shown what a good sound is because we think we do. And, you know, those first records we were working on, it's, it's 100 percent hit or miss. Like. <laughs> Target could be like right here in front of us, dead center. We over here punching to the far left, the far right. So you know? true. Mm -hmm. And and it really is hit or miss until you learn. And once you learn, you can't unlearn it. Very true. Yeah. Mix. Once you hear a good mix, once you hear a good microphone, yeah, yeah you can't unhear that. It's it's in you forever, and yeah, you'll it, realize it's a quick. burning process because now mm -hmm. that you once you start using it, and, and again, I tell this to younger engineers: once once you start using all this expensive and pretty lights gear, you start to realize those are just little icings on the cake. You use those pieces because they give you a, an end result that is familiar to you and that you like. So it doesn't have to be a thousand dollar microphone, twenty five thousand dollar microphone. It can be a five hundred dollar microphone. But gear, certain pieces of gear exist within a certain realm of this chain sounds really good because it's tried and true. Mm. New stuff appears and we have to give it its testing time because, again, when digital plugins started coming out, they were not tried and true. The, yep. the 90s is littered with horrible, horrible L2 destroyed mixes. Yep. Like all over the place. <laughs> L2, L2 the mix. <laughs> that was the term. Like the for term. me, sometimes it's really hard, like, to explain to somebody, like, who never understood, like, or was shown what is a really good sound or mix, as you said, William, because, like, I still have like friends or producers, and they have a totally like different approach. Like, they would use a clipper, as you said, you don't use a clipper. They would use a clipper on each bus like drum bass yeah. clip, mm -hmm. vocals clipping and they get so proud because because they can push that mix <laughs> to the sky to the sky and everybody's like wow man it sounds so loud and when i just listen to that mix it, it, it's like it sounds loud but, but it's like squashed it's 2d it's, it's like yep. it, it it's thin it's just like I don't know how to explain it. Like, it no, no, no. I, 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 you know what? I have a phrase for that. And, and again, I, I'm, 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 I'm the wise man engineer. So I, I, that's just how I am. <laughs> I tell everybody, do not sacrifice quality for the sake of loudness. Yeah, but you know, they come back, and when I do the like, the, as Rob said, uh, how they say the. Uh, mm, you spoke about earlier of uh, i just forgot about it uh like yeah the revisions like when you do the mix revisions the main the the main problem let's say problem <laughs> uh 
uh, for what they come back is like, hey, mine is not as loud as his mix. And uh. he's sending me some YouTube link. And I said, okay, but let's analyze that mix a bit or let that's why you have a volume button. You can turn it up, man. You, you know, you, that's why you have a freaking button. You just turn it up, man. You don't have to, like, I don't want to bring it up with the limiter. And for me, it was, as you said, William, like a, a life lesson when I had a chance to get a, in a close, like, relationship with an engineer, recording engineer at uh, Air Studios in London. And when I get into that classical world and th that stuff, it really like changed my whole idea how mm -hmm. a mix should sound. But for me now, this is a struggle to be honest, because those guys hitting those clippers and everything, they are kind of preferred from these old <laughs> thinking guys, as I, as I said, like old school guys. Because today's kids just want that loud sound. They, yeah. they don't even know how could sound like record, recorded in a proper way or done in a proper way. But they don't know it. So they just go for that sound. And like, you're out because you're not so loud, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a harsh truth. Like, I don't know. That's, I faced it. So. No, no. And, and so. I, I'm from that time too, and I, I understand that. I fully understand that. Like so, in my in my travels for that, that was my biggest. That was one of the things that that was one of the first things when I kind of met the group, um, like four years ago. That was my one of them, that was like my biggest mountain to climb. How how do I solve the problem of being loud? And what it did was it kind of it took me back to like my beginnings and all the other engineers that I learned from and the bigger guys I talked to coming up. And what I realized was, number one, it, 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 it that was kind of like where the spark for I need to get this gear kind of came from, because I came up I came up learning a lot of different techniques under a lot of like different like higher up engineers. But that's when you're younger and getting to the end goal is all that matters. So, you know, you learn all the cool and fly techniques, but it's the basics, the editing, the setup that you don't really learn because again, it's just the flow of let's get this done. Let's go. Let's go. I, it took me re studying like all the moves of Chris Lord algae. It took me like talking to him. Same thing with Dave. It took me the same thing. I have, I'm talking to Dave Pensado. You know what I'm saying? Um, talking to, um, what was it? Um, Tom Lord Algae, like talking to all these different guys that have solved that problem in their own way, and it it, it let it learned me back into the. I, rem, I this was so long ago. I remember it took me back into mixing with mixing with a limiter on my mix bus, or master fader or master bus, and going back into those teachings again i was like okay i can get it loud because i'm mixing into this and my decisions are based off of this and then going down the rabbit hole of let me find a great limiter that matches my sonic like fingerprint and signature that i want and then on top of that kind of building and solving the issues before they become issues so like like rob was saying my me rob and hb we love the SSL sound. Yes. Like I came up on an SSL 4000 console. So I'm like, I love this sound. I'm just not spending SSL 4000 console money. So before HB got his big six and before Rob got his, I was doing mine piece by piece off of what I remembered. So my mine is like a 500 series ode to SSL as far as the sound and everything goes. It's funny because we all get a very similar sound for the end of our records now, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we but we nail it, but we nail it. So that's the thing. I started to realize the reality is I'm I'm doing these same moves digitally in the box. I don't want to. Because I remember not having to do that when I was coming up. So how do we solve that? We just start solving the problems now. So I got a better maker limiter. 
because I got tired of just limiting outside the box, but I'm, I'm hitting my pure two converter because I like the sound of clipping because I like ozone and I like what ozone was doing. Cool. That solved that want and that need stereo with, you know what I mean? Running your channels, multiple channels through a console console setup or even something of that nature, even, even when you have a, <clears throat> a summing unit with multiple transformers, mul you know, mul just multiple pieces going through, it gives it, a, it changes the stereo image. You know what I mean? Wider is subjective, but it does change it because of the variance in each single channel. Mm -hmm. But that does give you the thought and appearance of why. I like that. Got the SPL big, so that way I can <laughs> I can do something of that nature for myself. Um, the Cayenne four thousand. Its literal whole whole concept is to to emulate the drive perspective of driving an SSL console with the VU meters into the red. Bought that, so now I can just drive my mix as hard and as hot as I wanted to. Putting these pieces together got me to the place where I'm like, ah, oh, sonically, I love this. Mm. This is this is what it felt like. What I remember it feeling like. Those, again, ultimately, it's one of those things where if you solve these issues first, they no longer become issues ever again. Very, very so, true. So, like now, mixes now getting getting to like minus nine LUFS or minus ten is easy. Easy. Yep. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Like the God particle. Hell, look. For look, just just for kicks, you, I throw L two on there every once in a while, just just for the nostalgia factor, because L two has it has its sound to it. Mm -hmm. But we can, I mean, heck, even the new orange clip <laughs> with Schwab, these he, guys are talking about like minus two point five, minus two, and I I'm I'm, I'm like, man, dude, if you're doing if you're doing, heavy, if you're doing heavy metal music, I'll bite. If you're doing anything else outside of heavy metal, unacceptable. Yeah, that's <laughs> way loud. And, Holy and, crap. and it's and that that loud that kind of loud is really detrimental to your to your record actually, because at that point, at that point, you you're not competing anymore. It we we talk really really and we me and Rob talked about this a lot. Like back in the day, we talked about this a lot. Competing is a very big thing. There, there's such a thing as getting up to competition level. And then getting out of that, like at minus two, they've they've gone there. They're out of the competition. They're no longer in competition anymore. You're too loud. You're that's ridiculously loud. Like, <laughs> Dude, you know, I, yeah, that like why at that point? Why uh, again? <laughs> I, I, look, I, I'm I've been mixing metal records and minus five, sure. And and for some, I'll tell you this. I don't know what it is. Getting to minus five on a metal record is fairly easy. Like makes sense. That makes it's sense. Easier than, it's easier than on EDM or dance, for yeah, example. It, Very it, easy. The, the pure density of the music. Yes. It, it will drive you there. It, it really does it's, drive it there. Sure. Mm -hmm. But like any other genre, like imagine a country song in minus two. <laughs> well, for that matter, hip hop, like or a ballad, open ballad. Come Did on, you imagine man. a ballad it's in minus two. Magic, it's like the, the singer, the the singer, the kick, the snare, everything just <laughs> smacking in your face. <laughs> no doubt. Look, trap records at minus two. The hi hats would kill us all. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, unbelievable. Yeah, one hundred percent. It'd be annoying. It, you'd be in the club, and it would just be the. That 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 would no no one's dancing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the speakers would literally just be humming. You know, like there's <laughs> something about this, like going kind of going back. We're talking about loudness, and then going back to like consoles and like how they they introduce this like stereo image. It's it's I don't want to say it's hard to achieve digitally, but like you got to do a lot more to do it digitally. Ooh, you know, you and work. so. You got to work. <laughs> There's like a perceived loudness that comes with like real passing signals through real life circuitry. Yeah. Because it's introducing harmonic distortion throughout the entire signal. And that alone is giving it a lift, not just at the top, but at the bottom as well. And so, you know, the image of it is automatically filling up. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the beauty of analog gear. That's the whole reason why I wanted it. Cause I'm like, 
I'm sick of trying to have to recreate this digitally, you know, like grab all these saturators and these emulators of transformers and so on and so forth. And I knew I could just get a console and achieve it like that. And like you said, to, to now get to minus nine to minus six is like, I mean, that's like not hard at all. Like it just does it for yeah, me. It, I, I find myself turning more things down than turning more things up. But, but again, it, I'm an analytical, I'm a little analytical guy too. So like, I've been trying to have my, my, um, by the wave movement. <laughs> so people will stop listening to streaming platforms for their references. So like, yeah, by the wave file. So like, I'll tell people like, go to Cobuzz, get the wave file and like analyze it yourself, you know, because what, you know what I mean? Cause, cause what you start realizing is the consistent, the consistency of our industry, it becomes very apparent. Minus minus five, minus six, minus cell, seven LUFS becomes very apparent throughout the same genres all the time. And then you start noticing the patterns. You start noticing how the low end sounds across genres. You start noticing how vocals sound across genres. You start finding the pocket of the low end in all in all of its aspects will always be louder than the rest of the music in the music. But the perception is it's mm -hmm. all leveled and balanced out. But if you look on any frequency analyzer, you see the low end is like top, top. And then everything just kind of slowly slopes down. And I know for young engineers, they're like, how the hell do you do that without just turning everything up? Well, that's the that's the beautiful part about it. You know, the old the old sayings still apply. If everything is loud, then nothing is loud. Yeah, if everything's in stereo, nothing's in stereo. Like, you know what I mean? Some, mm. some things got to go to the left and get sacrificed on the right. Some things go to the right to get sacrificed on the left. Why? Because the perception of depth and 3D-ness, we only really get but so many tools to pull that off. And the reality is, if you overdo it, it becomes very obvious. You know, it's like when someone says, how do you get that air on the vocal? Because every time I do it, don't finish the sentence. Every time you do it, it sounds harsh, right? Yeah, it's because you're doing you're going to you're doing too much. Yeah, your, your perception of the top end has not matured to actually let you hear what you're supposed to hear yet. It, mm. It's like the low end. I, when I was younger, I was real sensitive to low end, so I never put enough in the music. You see what I'm saying? I, I had to grow yeah. into that. <laughs> yeah, the years I like to change. I do like an annual like visit to the doctor just to check my internal ear as well mm -hmm. as hearing and everything. And it was really interesting because uh, like four weeks ago, I had a cold and um, I had like, I kind of felt like I have water or something like I, I'm submerged like <laughs> under the water. Oh, that whooshing sound? Of, yeah. And all the, all the low end just started like to resonate in my ears. It was horrible. And I went to the doctor and I said, man, I can't work like this. I can't like, I, I barely like listen to low and like, and he's like, do you have a cold or something like, yes. And he did some measurements and he was like, man, your internal ear is affected. And I had like a 10 dB sensitivity on the low end. And it was more, <laughs> it was a lot. And it was a lot. Yeah. yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it was a lot. And it took me like two weeks to Ooh. to heal like to heal from that cold and I get over but I realized man like it's so subjective like what we hear how I hear it or how Rob's or how you hear it is like because everybody's ear is unique so just that's a great way to, that's a great way to put it and great way to think about it I, I mean I'm well aware of like we all listen to music differently not just in terms of sound but in terms of genre and style and taste and, yeah. and it just keeps getting stretched out but some people are super sensitive to low end and some people are super sensitive to high or end needs or highs if you just do a, a proper test like a, a proper test for your ears you will have like a chart on a spe wow. like a speaker chart and uh, for example my right ear is a bit more sensible like with 2d two and a half db or around 600 no around 2.5k two and a half db up on my right ear. Wow. So I have a chart and I know, man, okay, 
and I do take it in like in consideration because I know I have to work with with this. But everybody have these kind of imbalances, but mm -hmm. we don't know it because we don't measure it. You know, true. That, that, you don't know it because you don't measure. It, but if you go to the doctor, you will find out. Man, I don't hear with my left ear as with my right ear, and it's normal. Like your brain will compensate for that two and a half dB because it's really small. But it's a fun fact to know that you have something over there or you should be more careful or train your ear in that zone. Let's see, okay, how I perceive this song or the other one. It's nice once in a while to do this test. It's, it's like a health check for somebody else, for an engineer. <laughs> it would be it would be nice to know, man, I don't hear the low and wide because I have minus 6 dB like loss in my left ear. So. Yeah. Maybe Very that's true. why I push up all the records. <laughs> but, but you know what? That's that's the way that's the way it should be. We we are professionals. So yes. Yes. It we should. Like I, I look, I have I have an at home professional ear cleaning kit. Like I that's I never can't. ever clean your ears, guys, with those sticks or how yeah, do you call them? Price. Stop using yeah. cotton swabs. Don't use no cotton swabs. Yeah. <laughs> it says it the box. It says on the box. Yeah, it just go for a professional cleaning and it's I do once in a year or twice in a year like a cleaning at the doctor's office and I just go like but why do you come here what, what's your problem no I just want to do a check and a clean that's all like like the car maintenance like the car maintenance <laughs> but, but you know what you're but you're right though like getting getting checked out by the doctor everybody should do that at least once or twice a year like mm -hmm. like for me it was one of those I got the, I got the kit. It's got the little um. It's got the app. It's got the little camera on it. But yeah, I clean my ears. Like, dude, after that, I'm never going back. I clean my ears literally once a month, yeah. and it's like, it's like a whole new experience. It's like again, it's like cleaning your car. It's like once you get your car cleaned and detailed, you're just like ah. It's like bringing. It's it's like it just it just feels brand new. You know what I'm saying? Like like dude, I I ain't gonna lie. I love mixing after cleaning my ears. Because like clean your ears, get a good nice rest. You wake up, you hear everything. <laughs> if, you know, there, the, there's, you, hear, you hear the the the, the smallest details. Oh man! And, and like you said, we're professionals. I think like if you're an engineer, definitely doing stuff like that is super important. There's a there's an interesting thing that Dan um, likes to talk about, <clears throat> and I think that this is important for like younger engineers. We perceive sound right here. Yes. You want to aim like tweeters, like closer to the middle of your face, because when the, when the sound enters in, we're perceiving it like literally from the center of our face. Mm -hmm. And Dan always points right here. And it's so true. And when you think about that, and I've like, I try to sit in my sweet spot where I have the tweeters where they're aimed right there, right at the middle of my face. And this has helped a lot in terms of like how I'm, especially here in the high end, because when we're breaking all this down, I'm sensitive to high frequencies, very sensitive. And I, and I prefer darker mixes that are like more weight. That's just like what I personally prefer. Mm -hmm. And I've recognized that I got to push the highs a little more because my ears are telling me, yeah, that's a bit annoying, but there's a lot of people out there that are like, nah, that's dark, you know? And I'm like, that's like, and I've even been in like, I've been in spaces where I'm like hearing like these whistles and I'm like telling my wife, I'm like, what is that? She's like, what are you talking about? Yep. I'm like, I can hear this clearly. And she's like, I don't hear anything. And so I realized, yeah, I'm very sensitive to high frequencies and kind of understanding those, you know, cleaning your ears. Like you said, getting your ear tested. You understand. I kind of, you know, I hear things a little differently over on this side of the frequency spectrum, you know, and then realizing how we perceive sound. All of these things help, you know, advance you as an engineer. Dude, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a quick shill, even though they're not paying me. L look, this is why I got the turn off. <laughs> turn off is like huge, <laughs> I, dude. I I can't. And and I was telling I was telling them yesterday on my live. I can't stress enough how much it has changed my mixing life. Mm. It's like, it it's weird. It it's like I feel <laughs> I feel like everything I I have been doing on my own was a lie. <laughs> And the trend off because it's like the trend off the stereo image, it becomes naturally wide, like to where your speakers are, but not not in a weird way, in a very, in a very picturesque triangular kind of way, and the center image, 
like just it, it That's just exactly what Brian said, dude. He said the same thing, man. It's dude, <laughs> like it it it's I it's really hard to explain. The best I can explain it is you if you've been in expensive studios where like where like a, a great acoustician has gone and done work, it's that. That's mm. what that is. Where the phase and the treatment have met in this beautiful symmetry and everything sounds the way it's supposed to sound as you move it in that space. So like when I move something left, I can hear and feel I've moved it left. When I, when I turned the fader down, I can hear or feel that has pushed it back. It it's it's really crazy. It's one of those things like you really got to you really have to experience it for yourself. And it's not one of those like oh it takes time. It's literally night and day. Like mm-hmm. it's A and B. You literally I, dude, when I first got it, because I can do it now, because I have both my sets, my um, my two interfaces. So I have one. I have it set up on the um, the Pure Two, and then on the Orion is just normal. Hearing music is so crazy like that, because when you bypass it, it's like again, my 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 mental image of how I've heard music my whole life literally breaks down. My perceived image of how I of how I both was mixing records, perceiving records, enjoying records, complete breakdown. And then now when I hear records that I've worked on it out in the world again, in a car, on the phone, everything translates, but there's a level of depth now that I get from mixing that I really, really didn't have before. Mm. Well, that's a good, that's a good buy then. You know, that's like, oh dude, it, it's, I it's the one. It's the if 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 it's on. Look, we always have that scenario, like you know, desert island, or if the studio's on fire, what are you saving? If my studio is burning down, and I'm talking like, if I stay in here for like ten seconds more, I'm gonna die. The trade off is out of here, and I, and that's the end of that. Everything else is is gone to the wind. <laughs> like that's it, out of hey. all the stuff. Like the, the, the <laughs> good friend I always talk about, he he just puts it in such basic terms, but he's like, if you can't hear it, how can you fix it? And like engineers truly have to realize how important your monitor system is. And at the end of the day, like this is everything, not plugged in for them. Yeah, in the studio. <laughs> most important piece. And like, you know, yeah. let's even unpack this because I think a lot of younger engineers don't even understand this, but the trend off will not only measure all the reflections within the room and rebalance you know, the, 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 the frequencies and flatten out your monitors, but they'll also give you a, a perceived like stereo image. Right. But also the, the, sometimes your speakers are like, you got the right speaker a little higher than yep. one. And then the left is a little lower yep. and, it, and it, and it rebalances. It will tell you like you're off and you got to lift your speaker up a little bit. These things are crazy important when it comes to hearing like flat, and, accurate sound. And the phase coherency. The the phase coherency is the number one thing. And and again, it's the difference between, again, how the, the closest thing I can relate, going to over the top expensive ass studio. So like, <coughs> excuse me, being in like NRG, being at Paramount, being at um at Quad, you know what I'm saying? Um, being at these bigger studios where they spent the like close to the million, if not the million on the room treatment, having the acoustician being like, okay, we need to move this and put this here and this, this, and this. Once we move the console here, we'll do more measurements and we'll make sure we take care of any reflections off the surface that because it, the trend off also the, the phase coherency of the, of the room with the gear, with the speakers, with me in it, in my sweet spot. Right. So it's like, like one. It, it's weird, right? And, and Brian will tell you one. The it, the sweet spot, like the triangle. We I, I hear everything here. Like it's like right here. You step one foot out <laughs> of the sweet spot here, everything's back to normal. Mm-hmm. And it's literally like one foot in, one foot out, and you, you can instantly hear the difference. Like the low end in front of me, with the trim off working, is perfect and it's balanced and it's beautiful and it sounds you know obviously genre dependent cool i walk over here to the other side and, and you've been here you've been here in the studio before rob so you know once you walk to the door by the booth right there like literally that th- five six inches boom, boom. <laughs> 
hitting like a Mack truck. Everything is clear as day. It's just, but it's loud. And I'm just like, this is nuts. Mm. Incredible, but nuts. Oh, dude. You gotta love stuff like that. That's the stuff that works, you know? And like, to, yes. to me, like when, when I hear things, like, I'm like, okay, I could totally jump on this bandwagon. I know I'm going to have to get it from my studio eventually. And just understanding what we're talking about here, like the most important tool to an engineer is your monitor system. And to get that right. Mm -hmm. Like, in fact, I would argue that the, the difference from back in the day to today is they spent a lot more time with, like you say, they brought in the sound guys and these acoustic guys and they set up these rooms correctly. And they did a lot of measuring and getting their monitors set up and, and they didn't need a lot of gear to get good sound because if you hear things that, you know, flat, and how it's coming out, like you could fix where the issues are. But yeah. if it's tailored monitors and you got reflection issues and you know the room isn't correct and so on and so forth, like you're doing work that isn't necessary at that point. Oh, dude, it's 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 one of those weird things because again, I, I've gone back and I've listened to older records, and now you can just kind of hear it. It's like, oh man, I could tell the engineer was tired. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can you can tell they didn't take a break when they did this record. You can <laughs> it's what you said. It's like once you hear a good sound, you can't unhear it, and then you could go back to old stuff, and you're like, man, like it's all over this. How did I not hear it then? And it's that perspective. It's this paradigm. Yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah. Be, because we all hear, we all hear. Obviously, yes, we all hear music differently. But there's a there's a way again, and because we're, we're professionals, there's a certain way that we hear music that the average person will never hear music. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. like as a, as an audio engineer, as a professional audio engineer, my brain can, whether sometimes just, it's just out of habit, my brain can focus in on one sound on a, on a song and tune everything else out and get hyper-focused on one sound because now my brain is trying to analyze where that sound is, where directionally, where is it coming from and how could I achieve that? if I need to use that one day myself. And sometimes it's on purpose, sometimes it's not, you know. It's like, you know how people, you know when you drive your car, you get from point A to point B and sometimes you just black out in thought. Oh yeah. But because of muscle memory, your your brain literally puts you on autopilot to make sure you get you get to point B safely, but you've had whole thoughts in your head on something completely else. That's that's how it is for for us. So true. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say this because it's is kind of funny, but my wife always she will listen to music and she's like, God, you just ruined music for me. She's, she's now I listen to the snare. Now I listen to the, the hi hats. And she's like, like, I don't even know what those were before you. And, and, and she could tell me now because I get so critical on things. And when I listen to music, it's always from a professional standpoint of like, mm -hmm. wow, that's amazing. I wonder if I could do that. And it gives me ideas. And so I'm always listening to like, just more in sound and production, of course. But, you know, like, I'll point out to my wife. I'm like, oh, did you hear how they did the snare? And so she's picking up on the lingo. And she's like, now I listen to music that way. And she's like, I don't want to listen to music that way. It just cracks me up because we do. We all, like, if, if you are an engineer, you're a producer, we listen to music entirely different from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. This it, isn't an experience to us. We're analyzing every oh. single piece of it. And like, mm -hmm. is it good or bad? What can I do this? You know, like all yep. of those things in our brain. It's it's so weird because it's like, you know, when you're younger, that's that's like a it, in my mind. I'm like, this is what Superman felt like when he first got his powers when he was young. <laughs> it's like, I can't turn this off. How do I, I, I how do I how do I turn this off? Because because for and again, it's this is like the fire path that all engineers and producers have to walk through. Because when you first start that journey, you critically analyze everything and you can't turn it off. Nope. And then it's like a it's like a good a good solid year before you learn to okay, I can hear this, and then you can just listen to music for the enjoyment. And then your analytical side starts to balance out with your enjoyment side again, your normal everyday average person side. And man that is like that's like the worst year ever <laughs> and it's this whole little like battle in, in that ensues in your brain and you just can't get it out but you're right you get to this overcritical mindset of just over analyzing everything and trying to get better and then and eventually you fall into your sound and what you want and 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 then you could get back to listening to music and enjoying it i try like i do this a lot like 
uh, when I listen to, especially like if I'm just listening to music, I'm not trying to be critical. If I'm in the gym or in the car, I try to get out of my brain, you know, and I'll find myself slipping, but I just enjoy the music. I don't need to like, care about how the snare sounds and you know, like, <laughs> well, where did they bump the highs in the vocals? Like, I don't need to care about that. Like, <laughs> it's like, oh, this is over compressed. Why? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, even at this point, like I've gotten, I make so much music and so at times, man, there's like, I could always listen to my stuff and be like, I can fix that and do this. But I've like gotten away from that too, because I just realized that like, I'm literally just like fighting myself here. Like listeners typically aren't going to say anything about it at the end of the, at the end of it. And how I listen to even my mixes is I'll go into my garage, throw the song on and then start doing something. And so I'm focused on what I'm doing. If I'm, you know, working on a car, whatever it is and listening to the music in the background and that gives me way better perspective now i feel like a listener and i'm not just trying to pick things apart especially if we're at the final like we already know like you know uh, at least my, my artists and, and and myself like we're, we're pretty good at just like we have a term we call it dft and it's done effing deal <laughs> and so we just say that all the time it's like you know we're not going to get over critical on things and you know if, if it sounds good if it feels good we don't leave it yeah they, yeah we don't, we don't need to worry it. about it I, mm -hmm. that's that 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 is probably one of the biggest killers of young engineers because 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 you know there, there's no mentor to tell you it's good don't don't mess it up no more mm -hmm. you know there's there's there is no one to tell you okay stop oh. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that earlier like um in fact isaac was saying he just did a, a record with someone where they did 16 revisions and they ended up picking number three and i went through it too i did eight revisions for someone and we picked number one I always like f found for me at least it works when I receive a, a, something to to mix like the first back. half hour forty yeah, minutes back. are my best decisions that I ever can make on that mix. Yeah. After that, I know it's gonna go. So I'm not like picking on stuff. I'm just start to mix on general like the the big the big picture. And all of the editing, the small things, like I leave it just for later. But I know that I'm critical and I'm okay, like calibrated for the next 40 minutes. After that, I'm not guaranteed for the, what comes. No, you're right. You're right. Um, you know, you know what? It's it's funny though, because it's like again, when once you kind of get to that space and you're just kind of locked in, you know you're now now you're fighting the clock of like of like your your body because you know after a while your ears kind of start doing this biological clock yeah. <laughs> so, so you're like okay okay we're gonna we're gonna get the we're gonna get the most important things out the way first take that break come back <laughs> and you know what sucks about taking a break i realize and this is just again this is just myself it sucks because sometimes i just don't want to go outside to take a break but i know <laughs> if, if you i know if you go outside it resets your ears faster than every yeah, like taking true. a break anywhere else <laughs> Yep. Because like for some reason your ears are like, oh my God, it's natural sound. They open back up. They're just like, yeah. <laughs> like, oh man. The the things we all we all end up learning to make our careers better. <laughs> yeah, there's the, the the thing about this, and I said it earlier, but um I think that the most beautiful thing about this business is there's no ceiling in every aspect. Meaning you could learn you could constantly get better at engineering and there's an endless amount of information and gear out there you know you could constantly get better with clientele you, you, you know it, it you could constantly switch out your studio it just to me that's what i'm intrigued by the most you know and i think if anything <clears throat> kind of going to back going back to talking about these mixes i think what's extremely important especially for an artist hiring an engineer the first mix tom said it you get into this flow state and we get really locked in on the first mix Second mix, we could go through and just like nitpicking stuff, right? Maybe turn this up a dB or, you know, l l some slight EQ moves or whatever. And that would be the artist taste, right? And then maybe third mix, like we're, we're finalizing this, right? But mm -hmm. that what my point is, is like getting in that flow state in the first go around, it's very difficult to do that again in the, within the same mix, especially for eight or nine revisions in. We're walking backwards at this point. You know, I, it's it's to me like... Whenever I get into those situations, I'm almost frustrated at that point. You know, it's like, what are we doing here? Do you know how I solve this problem, Rob? Like, <laughs> I, I, charge, I charge after the third I have, so I solve I have, mine. <laughs> like, I have, like, 
I offer like free revisions for free. And I know why I offer just for free, <laughs> free revisions. And if you want the fourth, the fifth, the second, the tenth, the fifteenth one, you pay. You pay. <laughs> oh, dude, I, I mean, was... like that. That's how I am after three. It's yeah. You yeah. you get three free revisions. Three is the sweet spot. That really is the sweet spot. Yeah, it is. because after three, we 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 should be locked in by three should... because because the first revision, the first revision is usually both taste and people's like like it's usually their taste and the questions they might have asked in like a group setting right first revision okay second revisions are usually their gut feelings that they that they didn't think mattered the first revision absolutely third revisions if we if we make it to a third revision it's wrap up time it's wrap up it is yeah like we're wrapping this up because because by the third revision we've addressed we should have addressed everything prior and now 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 is the nitpicking part i'm 100 i look listen if we make it to a third revision i'm always 100 percent cool with it because because i know and they know this is it i had a i had a guy sending me over some orchestral stuff from budapest and man he was like super duper analytical i knew him like like six or eight years but it was getting some money for the project and I said, okay, Tom, would you mix this? Okay. And we ended up on the sixth, the seventh revision. Mm. And he's like, he's like, man, I do have a problem. I said, okay, please give me like an Excel or Word file. Like just yes. state all the points that you, if you have a problem and I still have that Word document. <laughs> and I use it then as, as an example, because he was stating the following like, second strings on beat uh, 45 minus 0 0.5 db down and these kind of stuff and i was like man they, these are he's not hearing this stuff and i demonstrated him because he was kind of a friend i recorded a video with myself i said hey i'm just gonna send you this mix and i showed the the watch the, the google time that is real it's pre-recorded i'm not, i just don't want to fuck you up it's pre-recorded it's recorded and i'm not gonna modify anything what you said what you sent to me i'm not gonna change anything i'm just gonna send you back the same mix <laughs> gen 7 with a different name because <laughs> you would catch you would end a different render but it's gonna be the same and you would not notice anything. You would say that it's, it's been fixed. And I did that. I sent it back. I, and I got back the answer. And he was like, now it's perfect. I said, okay, now wait. I need to show you a video. Yep, yep. <laughs> and look. And he was, he was kind of surprised, a bit offended. But he, because he was kind of a friend, I like I permitted to do something like this <laughs> with a client. Is <laughs> it's not gonna end up in a bad way? Oh yeah, I there said, never been a video if it was a client. I, I know. Yeah, I said, <laughs> look, I did this too because you're like kind of a friend of mine. I know you from a while, man. You're not hearing those minus zero point five dBs because I don't hear them. Is it possible for you to hear in a mix like minus and exactly on the beat forty five? And did I prove it to you that you can't hear anything what you wrote down, like two pages in Word? I had 36 points to fix. 36 <laughs> points. Wow. And uh, like EQ stuff, like reverb, like the pre delay on the reverb should be 300 M. I said, man, <laughs> man, if you hear in the mix the pre delay of the reverb, I'm selling yeah, all my bought. gear. <laughs> I'm selling all my gear and all the money goes to you, like everything. And I quit. I just quit. <laughs> so you're mixing was, way better than me. <laughs> yeah. And he was stunned. He was like, man, but it's not the same mix. Like he was like, he, he wouldn't, man, it's not the man, it's the same mix, but with a different name. I renamed the same file. <laughs> it's the same mix. So what we're doing here, like going to revision 20 or 30 or 40 for what? It's done yeah. already. It's done. It, but he was super analytical uh, and critical. And these guys, these OCD guys, because I'm one of those as well. I know it's really hard to work with these guys. It's really super hard. Like it is. You're so, so right. Because they are. They're very critical. 
Yeah, but you know what? That's the but that but again, that's that's kind of the name of the game, and I, I applaud you for that. I applaud you for that. See, I I had a client and that happened to right, and I had I had two of my own intern guys in here, and this happened months ago, and they're like, "Hey, now now here's the thing. By the time I get to the third revision on a record, I'm using audio movers. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm, I, that's that's my rule. By yeah. the time I get to number three, if we've made it to number three, it's that's audio true. movers. So you're gonna hear this in real time as I'm doing it. Tell me why audio movers set up right. Um. Rob's gonna laugh at this. So I use Reaper. Rob, I mix this record all in Pro Tools. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Because because they were like, well, me and my engineer, we normally do this, this, and this. All right, cool. So you send me the Pro Tools files, I do my mixing in Pro Tools. Not a problem, right? Can you turn this reverb right here down? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Just just a tad little bit. Now before that, we there's like 20 things we're going down the list of changing on this one particular record, just like you said. <laughs> little moves here and there, and I'm just making these little adjustments, and then they're like, no, 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 no. Like, so we're playing it back, audio movers. I don't like the way that sounded on that one. Can, can we just turn it back up a little bit? I'm turning things back up to where they started. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm literally redoing, undoing all the things that they were asking. We get to this last, it's like, yeah, there's like two more things. It's like a last reverb line. And I'm looking at the guys and they're like, what in the heck are we doing? And I'm like, watch this. All right. Ready? Yeah. Hit the play button. That's perfect. I, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking dead off into space. Yeah. And just looking at me like, she's like, great. We're down to one last thing. Can you turn down the last thing? Sure. You ready? Yeah. Space bar. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, second, second. You're, you're nailing it. Thanks. <laughs> And I'm, and I'm just like, this is what I should have done before. Like, and it, and it, and again, it, it's one of those situations. It's not every situation. Clearly, it's not every situation. But it's that okay. that page long. Hey, can you turn this down by half a dB? Because realistically speaking, as engineers, we'll do it. Oh yeah, we'll do it. But mm-hmm. see, it be, it's the next line of revisions where it's like, can you turn it down another half of a dB? It's like, so you want a whole dB? Like that's that's really what you were asking for. Like, just, you just want me to turn it down, right? Like, <laughs> and use my best judgment. If that's what you really want to say, because you don't have to be technical with me. You can just say, "Hey, can you turn this down?" Yeah, it's easier. Turn, like, you know, you know what say, I mean. If they say, like, I always, uh, when I spot a guy like this, like, I always try to explain him how to give me back my like revision and my mm-hmm. feedback. I need to teach him, man. You don't need to be technical. You just have to focus on the bigger image. Mm-hmm. And what you feel on the first time, if you kind of feel that, okay, it's not groovy because the guitars are too loud in my metal or whatever, just yep. turn the whole stuff down, the harmony part or whatever, speak in your terms. And for me, yep. it's easier to do the revision because I know, ah, oh, it's not groovy. Okay, I know why it's we, not. Why speak, that that's the thing. We, we speak that language. We speak the language of your feelings. We hear, I, I hear you. It's like... <laughs> It, artists speak in the language of their feelings. We as engineers speak in technical terms, but we only do that when we talk to each other. Yep. When it yes. comes to an artist, by, look, I want you to tell me, man, that snare just sounds too harsh. Can we de-harsh that? Yes, we can. And you know what that just means for me? A little bit off the top end. Yep. That, 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 that. They don't have to understand what top end is. They don't have to. They don't have to see me take out eight k, seven k. They don't care about all that. They said it's too harsh. My job is to de harsh it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Like you. I mean, come on. We all. I feel like the vocals just are missing some weight. All right. Cool. Yep. Let, nice look, body in. Let, let's, the, cool. Let's, that, that's all you got to tell me. That's all yep. you have to tell me. Because because again, it's we again. I, and I tell people we speak that language. It's all right. <laughs> a professional engineer speaks that language. We we got you. Yeah, but when yeah, I always get like I always get standoffish on the turn down the reverb part because like reverbs are delicate. Like when 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 you find the sweet spot for them, it's like do you want me to turn that down? Do you realize it would change the whole thing? And so just what you're talking about, like unless it's like a, like I like to emphasize in certain phrases, well I'll pump a bunch of reverb in it. I'm like no problem, I'll turn that down. You know, but in terms of like the actual reverb for the track. Like when anyone's like, ah, it's a little too much. 
usually I'll just do it like a little bit of EQ out of it, you know, and not try to not try to change it too much because it's so delicate. If man, if a client at that point, so so that's that's when we have to then start start being the professionals that we are, because then it's like, now you want me to turn on reverb on the verse, the hook, the bridge, like he turned on all the reverb, all the reverb on what? <laughs> like that's the whole sound right there. You realize it's so important. So important. Yeah. I'm like, like I'm like I have an all reverb bus now, and if I turn down a DB on that, you're gonna feel it. it, it it's gonna be a huge change. The whole record shifting. Yep. And, and I've done that before, where like uh, there was one record I recently just did, and I had to turn down the reverb, and I listen to it now, and I'm like, oh, ugh. <laughs> It just doesn't sound good to me, but dude, yeah. Dude. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but then but then that's when you get that message back. Yeah, go and put it back. Hundred <laughs> percent. And, and that's the whole thing. It's like a lot of times when it comes to engineering, and and um, I'm sure y'all experience this. Like, there's a sweet spot that we have to hover in, right? It's like I got an idea to go in, but like, doesn't mean it's gonna work. You know, like there's so many things dictating what we're allowed to do within that track, with that within that record. You know, like putting a big hall reverb on, you know, uh, a hip hop record that is like really fast with a lot going on may not work, you know. And so when someone's like just drown it in reverb, it's like, yeah, I don't know if that's going to work for this record, you know. And, <laughs> and that's the one thing about understanding sound is that, you know, there's a set setting for each track. Like Will and I have talked about this, like, oh. you know, if you're doing chat jazz tune, right, like that's usually like a cafe set setting. So we're doing like room reverbs and get things kind of up close and personal. It's not like an open ballad. And, and you know, when you're listening to these types of records, like certain reverbs will create that sound and convince the human ear that that's what set setting we're in, you know, and that's how like I like to approach records. It's like, what set setting am I in? And then I want to recreate that within this mix. And, um, you know, if, a, if an artist is like, well, I just want to, I want it to sound like Post Malone, you know, it's like, yeah, but this isn't a Post Malone record. <laughs> it's like, hey, look, it doesn't that, sound anything like the instrumentation. It at that like, point, hold on. I'm asking for a reference. Because well, it's like, are we talking pre-Post Malone era? We talking <laughs> <laughs> pre-Malone? Pre Malone, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we talking post post Malone, or are we talking oh, pre Malone or post Malone? Which one is it? Because, because we're talking, look, there, there's a difference with post Malone between like right now and White Iverson, okay? <laughs> oh, totally, these are, these are two different post Malones we're talking about here. Like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta help me help you now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I do get that a lot, and I think that's like that's probably one of the hardest things I think I struggle with and what? with my artists is like breaking down to them how certain things affect the record and and making them realize like i understand that this is the sound you're going for but as dan likes to put it we're here to serve the music mm -hmm. and so i can't force this into that record like it will it will literally ruin the sound of it and so where, where can we compromise how can how can we figure out how to meet in the middle no that's true it's, i think i think that might be that that might be one of like the like the brass rings that we all try to get to when it comes to working on like with with every artist you know especially when it's like a new artist sometimes it's just like okay are we, sometimes we're the we're the people developing a sound sometimes we're the people accompanying me you know accompanying a sound you know sometimes we're the the idea giver and sometimes we are just a button pusher some and of them you don't understand some of them not i had a i had i had a buddy like who was first prize winner at the talent show and he was a bit egocentric but he was like oh tom could you do this mix for me and i said yes and i clearly asked for a reference track like please give me a reference and uh, he was kind of in a dance edm genre and the reference track totally in a different mainly kind of raga and totally other stuff and i said man i i can do your mix to sound like that one. I just can't. Like it, it's impossible. No, no. You, you, you sure you find a way you can do it, man. You're gonna waste your money. And I told you, you're gonna waste your money. You're He's gonna waste your money. If you can find a way to 100%. do it, hundred percent sure. And he was like, no, no. I trust you. I said, man. I told you. Okay, let's start the mix. I finished the mix. He was like, um, not really that mix. 
what what I said. And he was not satisfied, so he sent it over to even more mainstream engineer in Bucharest after in Budapest. So he spent 600, 600 euros on free mixes. <laughs> he wasn't happy with either of one <laughs> because he realized like, man, that's not my sound. And I told him, man, it's not going to be a problem of sound engineering here or mixing engineer, how good he is. You can't print the other sound to your genre. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. You have to redo your production if you want that sound. Yep. He, he, he learned that he, the, his lesson, but it, it costed him like 600 euros. And I, I, I told him before, man, you're going to pay me for nothing. Like, because... Hey, listen, he learned that lesson for cheap because dude i i've I, i've seen artists go the distance Way higher <laughs> the distance. Yeah. I, i've seen it happen dude like label clients will label clients will go the distance wow because <laughs> they, they they think man if that engineer is so mainstream that mainstream engineer probably knows 10 times better but if you watch close if you watch closely if you like learn a bit about that uh, guy that mixing engineer you kind of know that he's knowing his stuff but he probably didn't receive that uh, image or mainstream thing but he's good at what he's doing but they uh, kind of fall into this trap like i go to the top 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 and that top 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 sometimes does less than the other one who's mm -hmm. paid less and he's working really hard to get your record like sounding really good and i had this discussion uh, with uh, that guy who is uh, doing waves plugins how do you call it? he's a, the, the, the long beard guy you just have a love uh, your chefs uh, andrew i will say yeah andrew, andrew. yeah i hey he's a I was, look i was as i was uh, having you get a chance to hang out with andrew I was great, having a coffee with project. him and I said, man, can I look into your project? Like he had his laptop. Can I just take a like a look? If you don't mind. If you don't mind. <laughs> can I, can I, I was really kitchen polite. and see how you cook? I was, yeah, I was really polite, man. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I'm not like obsessed, but just for one thing. But you know what, Andrew, he's, a, he's a cool guy. So he probably said, yeah. yeah. He said, he said yeah, just took the light, take the laptop open whatever you want yep. <laughs> and i opened up like a, a rock he had a rock project and i was like hovering over the he, he's using pro tools and i was hovering over the insert section you know because that was my main focus insert section what is he using and i was like man this is so, so empty and i asked him like this is your final mix or are you just starting to, to mix on this project no that, that's the final mix and I was like, man, he's using just an EQ and a compression <laughs> on the on the channels and like so darn minimal, like very minimal. And I was like, man, and he's paid five times more than I do or six times. And people think that, man, if you go to the God, you know, he will give you everything. But he's doing kind of the same thing in his mind. But uh, he had a really, a really good answer. He was like, man, Tom, you can't fix a bad like production record. So why my mixes are like so good? Because I don't accept bad productions recordings. I just Thank refuse you. them. Thank I you. just refuse them. Yep. Like, you can be a good, like you can be a nominated or Grammy mixing engineer if the production is not up to that level. Yes, you, you can yes. be the god of the mixing engineer, but you can't bring that production up. So all, all the time I was thinking like, man, a Grammy engineer is actually a Grammy artist that sent him the thing. And because <laughs> of that artist's work, he has now as well, because he's just retouching and doing some nice stuff on a really good recording because you can do it, but when you can't do it and you do mainly like uh, sound editing, that's how I call it, not mixing, sound editing. When you do sound editing on a mix <laughs> to fix a lot of problems, that's not going to be a... It's not, it's not going to show off your mixing abilities, let's say like that. It's just you, you're getting paid 
it puts a bread on your table, okay, it's fine. But if you go out and you want to show a portfolio, like 80% of what I've done, I wouldn't be like very proud to show off because I know it was just for money. You know, it, it was a good, it wasn't the best production or recording. It's really hard to balance. This is so, I think this is so important to talk about because I get, I get asked it all the time. We all do. What's your vocal chain? This and that, and oh, like, I do this a lot. <laughs> if somebody my... would wrote, write a book, like a, the Bible of vocal chains, it wouldn't oh. be enough. <laughs> I think you know, every producer would buy yeah. it, you know, like. Oh, just as a side <laughs> note, no my, my mentor, Ken Lewis, he tried that and he quit. <laughs> he, like uh, if if you go to his ig he has a whole mixing night um thing where he would like ask us and different uh -huh. other big name engineer like friends and they would give him his vocal their vocal chains for mixing it was it varied so much he said he had to cut it down i think to two or three pages he had over 30 pages mm -hmm. and, and like we're talking the best of the best in our industry because Ken's been around for like 30 something years. So he's worked with everybody on everything. Dude, he was like, yeah, I, I just stopped. <laughs> well, like when I say like, and I know Kristen and Tom have heard me, but like when, when people ask me it, I say, it's the performing artist. They, they are first, first and foremost. When it comes down to your vocal chain, what are they doing? How are they performing it? How are they conveying the emotion? Literally, this is so freaking important. It's like the most important part of the conversation. Then what microphone are you choosing? What preamp are you choosing, right? And I'm not even getting into plugins or any of like the, the, the parts of the mixing. And if you're getting these three components correct, you're like 90% there. Like, and now, now, we're, now we're talking about what Andrew does. You just need a little bit of EQ and compression, throw some reverb, maybe a touch of delay. Like you're, you're off to the races. You don't need much. And that's what it is. It's, it's the foundation, you know, like the sound selection. I say it a lot. Like if your snare sounds off, do not leave that up to the mix. Go back and find one that works. Yeah. Do not stop until you find one that works. It's the same <laughs> thing with the recordings. If that sounds funny, if there's a weird wonky word in there, or clicks and pops and whatnot, if you have the ability to go back and re-record, get it done at the foundation. All of this is the key to good mixes. And I mean, Andrew, that's beautiful that he says that. He's like, you know, I just refuse bad recordings. That's how I'm a good engineer. And like, literally, that's what it comes from. It's like, I, if you work with the best, your job you are the best if you work with the best you have a good sound i'm telling you dude like yeah because rob you know this isn't the first time we've talked about that <laughs> I, I promise you tom this is not the first time we've talked about that and like but but yeah like so i'm on my grammy run this year that that's nice. dude yes yes the when when you are taking higher class recordings yes yeah because because you get you get to showcase your skill yeah exactly. that's the well, best thing in the world like you get to actually showcase what you can do to audio and it doesn't have to be every technique in the book it's 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 the old saying dave pensado used to say you're not getting paid you're not getting paid for your skill set you're getting paid for your taste mm. but again people that it's, it's like when you when we when people f review food everybody wants to be a food reviewer but the ones that we actually listen to go to the places where the food is the best because i want to know how this michelin star chef's food tastes right and if, if me if me reading a reviewer from a trust a review from a trusted reviewer is as close as i'm going to get until i go there it they're trusted for a reason their taste their palate is what we trust to hear about or hear from you know what i mean and yeah. that that rings so true because yeah dude a great recording engineer look a, a great recording engineer is hard to find nowadays and i and i tell you what thank god for every single one of them <laughs> well, you're a blessing you're an absolute blessing. For every listen i i pray to god this this breaks out on its own or someone's recording this i pray to god that you, that every recording engineer that hears this you are blessed from now until eternity okay because without you our jobs become infinitely harder yes because because i don't i, I i'm not an editor yeah. <laughs> I, i'm a mixing engineer i like mixing records 
I will edit because we have to, not because we want to. Yes. And for when recording engineers, when you name your files, when you put them in sequence, when they start from zero and end at the end of the song, God bless you. <laughs> okay. Like, especially when the vocals are recorded beautifully. Like, you ever get a song to mix and the levels are perfect on everything? Like, you literally, faders are at zero, whether it's physical or digital, and you just put them all up and the song is right in your face. And you're just like, yes. I, I did something good at some place and God has rewarded me. <laughs> like that, that just like shout out to my guy, Bill. He sent me a record. I don't know where he recorded it. I'm going to have to ask him. But whoever did that for him, I produced the record, but they tailored it up and sent it to me to mix. I'm like, what do I need to do to this? Y'all killed it. It's done. <laughs> like, Let me turn this up. I'll add a little bit of reverb, but I'm That's done. It. And just yeah. smile and send it back. That's what you do. <laughs> You Please. smile and send it back. <laughs> Please, we need more of you. Yeah, because like, I mean, and, and let's face it. I think a lot of people are focused on plugins and, and they're, they're skipping like the most important part. And that's why I'm, we're talking about this here is that like, you know, when you're asking questions, like, how do I get my vocals to sound better in a mix? Record them correctly. It's, it's really that simple. Like it, a, a, a properly recorded vocal will cut through the mix. Even a bad mix, it will cut right through it. Tom actually mentioned it in the in the last podcast we did, you know, understanding like um, how, how to deal with the reflections in your room when you record and like putting wood up on your wall adds tons of character to the recording, tons mm -hmm. of character. And like just kind of understanding how to, you know, take what you already have and squeeze the best out of it, like little techniques like that or, or what does it, you know, and, and believing in your performance like that is I mean, I can't stress that enough. You know, if you're, you're, if you're in a sad song, convince me you're sad in that moment, like convince me, you know, and, and don't leave that mic until, until you do like try to like imagine yourself in that scenario, that story you're telling yep. and, and, yep. and act as if you're literally living it that moment within the booth as you're recording it, you know, and these things are what hit home runs. These are the records that get repeated over and over and over mix is really never discussed on these records. They just translate. It's because at the end of the day, uh, I truly believe this. The message is way more important than anything, than the sound, than the production, anything. And when I speak on message, it even comes in the form of production. You know, like a guitar could talk to you, right? A melody could talk to you. And so we'll feel it rather than hear it. And and um, I can't remember who said this, but um, Martin Luther King, he didn't deliver his speech in a, you know, HD quality, perfectly mixed you know what I mean? Like it was the message behind it. That's why it was so powerful. And like, if we could recreate this as artists, as producers, and just to understand how important that aspect is, the mixing part of it is, is a breeze. It makes everything easy. Ooh, hold on. Let's, I like this. That's a good so, question. <laughs> it is. So, so they, they said, this is confusing because isn't that what people pay mixing engineers for? Mm. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if this person had been here for the longer part of our, our speaking, but here's the thing: you pay question. mixing. You pay mixing engineers because when you're recording, it's all about mindset, and and like basically people are doing the job that they are getting paid to do. When you're recording, the goal is to capture the best sound possible: the emotion, the rawness, the music, the song. That's what recording is for. Mixing is our job to take all that and make it sound good together. We are we are basically going to take your vision. Recording, your, you know what it is? I, I, I always break these down in simpler terms. Recording is you going to the grocery store, your local market, the farmer's market, and getting the best ingredients that you possibly can. And then you come to us and the level of chef you go to clearly depends on the level of money you want to pay. Exactly. So you go to your favorite chef with the money and you say, I want you to make me X, Y, and Z. And we go, okay. We come back to you with this amazing dish. But before we deliver that dish, we're going to go to mastering with this dish. And mastering is literally the person at the window who's going to make sure that 
toppings are on there, drizzle sauce is on there, the presentation is right. When you get that plate, you're going to know that what you paid for that plate was worth the money. That is recording, mixing, mastering. Now that's just me breaking it down in food terms. <laughs> Let me stretch this real quick too. I just want to add to this because th th there is a difference. There's a recording engineer and a mixing engineer. And that kind of have been conflated and mushed together, you know, as we've moved forward in the years. And let me just say this from an artist that's recording themselves. It, we are highly, highly dependent on you. So a mixing engineer is highly dependent on you to do that. It, you're part of it correctly. If you're sending it to us. We can't control the emotion you convey into a microphone. You know, that's on you. So you got to understand that. We can't control the levels you record at. So just, these are just this little things that you got to understand. If you're going to record yourself at home, it, it, at least understand the basics of how to do that. So when you pass it off to the engineer, they could do their job. This, this is truly a relationship. You know, um, we're, we're, we're mixing engineers, not fixing engineers. And so if you're leaving anything for us to fix, that 100% is not going to translate in the mix. There's a, a bad sound is a bad sound. It's that simple. We can mask it. We could do our thing. We could try to make it sound good, but truthfully, it's still going to be there. Like there's no like getting rid of it. And then you, you get what I mean. And so that's just something to understand. If you are a person recording yourself at home, just get the basics down to recording. It's really, really easy, by the way. Like, you know, it, it took a little bit of practice um, in terms of you like learning the performance part of it, but just getting your levels down, finding the sweet spot in your room, recording yourself correctly. Like these things are really easy to understand. And so that's all you got to do on your part. And and you, I guarantee you, you will get a way better record back from the mix engineer if, 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 if you do your best part. If I may, my take on that, <clears throat> I think, uh, so as far as I still proceed with gear and with plugins, what I realized is that in the past, you had an SSL board, you had probably four CLA-2As, four 1176. So you could not afford to put a chain with 15 devices because if you're putting everything on your vocal, what are you using on your snare drum and all that stuff? So that's why back then it was essential that the microphone and the gear that you're recording was sounding already good when it went through the SSL board. You're only touching a little bit there and there and putting probably one or two stuff on that, on that channel strip, right? Nowadays, because you don't have any limitation from a digital perspective, I feel like you're bringing saturation, which fixes one problem, but it damages another one. So you need another cube to correct the, the other one, but it takes away what you just did. So you bring another plugin to bring that up. So you're ending up with, I see some people having like, 13, 14 plugins on the vocal. And they're uh, so that person actually asked me and Tom, can you make this voice even better? Because it still sounds crap. And I told him, <laughs> you change the singer, not the plugins, because it's not the plugins the problem, right? Because in the past, no, so I don't wanna, you know, I'm also a home studio, right? I also have it at home. I don't have a professional one, right? I also deserve a chance to, you know, be there and make my music but in the past there was only those people singing that had a voice nowadays if you have auto-tune everybody's a singer right i can also try that still sounds good right and with ai there's no limit on that and that damages right because you had already a filter on i i know a lot of people will hate me with this but you had already a filter on the way into the studio you had the people that could sing. Yep. You had the instruments, which were analog, already in there. So you had already a filter. Nowadays, you have VSTs. Not every VST sounds good, right? So there are some that sounds good and some that don't. And if you want to have that analog feel in your VST, you need to put some hours in there, some EQ, some compression, some saturation. You need to bring it to sound like the analog. In the past, you had the analog. So just a little bit of a cue and a compression. That's why Tom is saying that Andrew Schaps is just putting two things because he's still on analog thinking. He doesn't think I have inserts without an end, right? Also in Pro Tools, you have, you know, you have from A to what, uh, G or something like that. So you don't have like without limits. 
check Ableton. There's no limitation. I can put plugins there, 100 plugins in chain. Nobody knows what the other one does. You forget where you started, where you're gonna go, right? So I'm not saying I'm doing it right, but I'm starting to figure out stuff as I'm building my hardware. And with my next track, I will stop putting plugins just for the sake I have them, just to make sure that my, you know, my synth is going the right way into the SSL board, it's coming halfway right, I'm doing some compression, and it should sound good. If it doesn't sound good, I need to go back to my synth and make sure it sounds good from the beginning, right? So that's my take on it. It's, you know, you don't have that filter anymore. So everything goes out. So everybody produces something, gives things. I also thought the same thing. I was even worse. I thought the mixing and mass engine will produce actually my track. I was like making some MIDIs and I sent it to someone and he said, what's this? And I said, this is for mix and mass. And he said, this is not even a demo. And I said, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, that's the problem. I wasn't, I didn't know what I'm talking about. You know, the, the sound the sound when it's leaving the producer, it needs to sound halfway done. So that means it needs to sound 80% there because the mix, it will take it from 80% to 95, more or less. And master will only do that 5% that touch of an IQ, the touch of a compression that, you know, you're just playing there from one to two dBs. Mm -hmm. They're not taking away, you know, like you have too much low end. Yeah, fix it in the production. Don't give it for me to fix it in the mixing. You know, you have face problem. I'm not going to redo your kick, right? However, when you're starting up and you need to do something, you're going to do that as well as a mixing engineer, or at least me and Tom, we are doing it. So the kick sounds bad, no problem. Bring another kick in, change that, right? With, of course, telling the producer that. Uh, <laughs> I, I was going to so say, hold on, man, hold on. <laughs> yeah, that's co-producing. But, you know, I saw also, uh, Rob already knows I'm a big, huge fan of Luca Petrolesi. Um, I love the way the guy is very creative in terms of mixing. And he took a track and he said, I didn't like that. So I redid the kick. So he kind of co-produced the track. Of course, he also says, it's not something I would usually do, but, and I don't really like doing that, but it sounds crap and I need to change it, right? So that's my take on it. Uh, be sure you're producing. So whoever's on the chat and doing it, that's also my problems. I have problems with in the past on my tracks. If you listen to my tracks, I hate all of them because each track is better as, as the other one, but even worse. So as far as I go with my knowledge, as I realize the stuff I did in production, that's, you know, really bad. Uh, but you need to fix the production and the recording. You cannot await that the mixing and the master engine will, you just, will do wonders, you know, you send there something that sounds crap and it will, you know, magic happens and get, goes out a full record, right? Or you think you produce something with VSTs, but you want to sound like Tiesto or like Dead Mouse, who has a castle with analog gear. So a little bit of reality check, you know? Very true. You know, are you using a free VST? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he's using a 4,000 4, uh, synth on that. <laughs> that makes a difference, yeah. you know? You're recording in your focus, right? Yes, no, he's recording in a cell console. <laughs> you know, and that builds up, you know? Uh, people are saying, yeah, there's not much difference. Yeah, but if you add 50 tracks with Big difference. 300 differences, adds up total different sound, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same, I, I love your, your example, William. You said the cookie, right? The, the cooking stuff. It's the same mm -hmm. as cooking. If on the receipt says three eggs and you say, yeah, two should be enough. And then it says 200 grams of sugar and just put 100. It's a different recipe. Yep. You start shorting when you start when, and, and this, and this is before you came back on here. This was like the first thing we talked about. And, and I, 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 I basically what I brought up was every engineer goes through their trial by fire of we've all spent thousands of dollars on plugins and cheap gear that if we could go back, we'd be like, no, and just, just go buy the piece that you wanted to get in the first place. And just have, you have that, you have to have the discipline in our industry, which is the number one thing in my, in my personal opinion, like above all things, you have to have the discipline to be successful, to succeed, to drive, because it's a disciplined mindset 
for all of us to get up in the morning, come do this, seek out clients, come do this, work on records, come do this, make a deadline, come do this. It's a, it is a discipline and you have to have that discipline. Yeah, in the beginning years, follow the recipe because realistically speaking, all of engineering has been laid out for like probably the last 40 years. And we always come in as a newer generation every time. It's new, it's improved, we can do it better. Just for all of us to end up in the same place. Yep. Hybrid mix. Yep. Hybrid mix. <laughs> <laughs> Just for basic, all of us. But I'm glad you, you said that, William, because now I showed you like I have the, uh, the SL and the Tegla and the SL, but I also have the Worm Audio 2A. Is it better than the plugin? Yes, it's 10% better than the plugin. Would I now buy the same thing again? No, because based on the gear that I already have, I would like to change that with the West Audio or with the actual Teletronics, right? Yes. So those differences. Me, build my up advice to is to the people out there: if you buy something, wait to buy the right one. Other way, it will not bring you the the excitement you're looking for. You know. Yep. So you're right. I see and those too. differences That's add up. Yeah, like the the five percent to a pro is everything because when you think about like NASCAR, right? They're milliseconds away. Like the top ten, you know what I mean? Like any race, two seconds, the, one point yeah, five. Like, like it's just so close when, when you and so for a pro, five percent is everything. That's I say it all the time. Save your money, buy the right gear. Like it, yeah, totally. Like well, going the cheap way. Mm -hmm. But you know why? But that's because again, either young engineers or or people that just aren't in our community or our profession, they they look at. When we say percent, they look at it from a standpoint of this. They don't realize that 5% is like this. Huge. It's huge. Because, because most of us work our way to get to like 70%, 80%. And then when you get to 85, 90, 95, it's, it's at this point, it becomes football. It's a game of inches. And let me tell you now, now it, you, you're, you're more critical now than ever before, because now it's like, I'm there, I'm already here. I'm now playing the game against people that are bigger and on a larger scale in a larger stage. So now every 1% is such a huge gain that again, for most people, they can only grasp it as, oh, it's just one percent. What's what's that gonna what's that gonna hurt? One percent. Um, imagine it being one percent of a billion dollar chain restaurant. <laughs> there you go. There it, you it go. Looks, Great it way it, to it put looks it. different then, doesn't it? it like that, yeah. but that's how we treat it because again, the the markup is huge from the concept of, well, of course, but it's a one. It's a it's a one percent that I need to, to, again, we're going to win this Grammy or this record goes gold or this record goes platinum or this star now signs their first deal or that money from that record bought them their house. Like it, we, people don't look at it in those kind of terms. Like this person just got their first car with that money. We get a percent of that. If, if we negotiated a certain way, shoot, there goes my down payment on X, Y, and Z for my kids. That 1%, it mattered. It mattered enough to get us here. Yep. Imagine what I'm, I'm glad you, you, you mentioned you know? the fact of percentage and getting money out of it. The problem is in life, if it's not touchable, it's not quantifiable. And if uh, it's not quantifiable, it's not worth the money. You know what I'm mm -hmm. trying to say? Mm -hmm. People are, you know, yeah. you're coming to a mix engineer and somebody is asking you, like, I had. Yeah. This happened to me in the past. So someone came to me and said, can you mix my track? And I said, yes. How many tracks do you have? 70. 70 tracks, guys. So I mixed the track. He was okay with that. He said, yeah, that's the best mix uh, from the mixes I had over Fiverr and whatever. So I'm going to keep that. And then I asked him for, for the money. He said, yeah, it's almost the same what I paid for the Fiverr. And then he said, yeah, but you're not mastering. I didn't say that I'm going to master it. You're just paying the mix. Mix, yeah. Yeah, I could go in another country and get the same thing, mix and master. You should have done it then. You know, it's, it's putting into question your work, right? So that's why I think when someone comes to you and you're saying a price, 
it feels like nobody wants to pay that price, you know? And mm -hmm. I don't understand that because it's my time in, it's, you know, I'm cutting down, probably going out and having dinner for mixing your track, right? And if it's also 70 tracks that I need to mix, I need to understand your track. I need to understand where you want to go to with that. I need to make sure each track sounds the right way. Just imagine just putting the AQ on every track, that's 70 EQs, just one <laughs> plug in, right? That you need to EQ on that. That's a whole lot of time. Yeah. yeah. And you're not, not paying any, not, not, not paying my skill. You're just paying for the raw time I need to take to do that, right? To bring in the tracks, to organize the tracks and so on and so forth. And I feel like people are very, I, I found like it's very hard to find someone who is paying for it and says, I'm willing to pay that amount of money because I know what work goes inside of that. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the same one. as with DJs. You yeah. don't pay DJs a lot of money because you cannot touch the music. That's why you pay the food because you can touch it. Everybody is concerned about how the location looks, how the food is, how the drinks are. But when it comes on paying the DJ, ah, well, paying the music, that's a lot of, that's a lot of money. Man, look, I, I, you know what? Okay, so I, I will go off of your point and I will add on to your point. So, and, and, and again, me and, me and Rob, we've had these conversations for God knows how, how many years now. Too many so times. <laughs> what it, yeah, because 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 I've I've had these conversations with Rob about just that. So I've learned this. I worry about the clients that say they worry about not just the record, but the marketing, the advertising, the production, the rollout of this record, the things they're looking to achieve, and not just for this record, but how this rollout is going to affect the next rollout for the next record. Those are normally the clients that I end up getting because those clients are the ones that are going to pay my thousand, fifteen hundred, two grand. Like they're going to pay it. They are going to pay it because they're worried about the mix competing with other people that they hear on the radio. And that's their that's their mentality for that. So they're going to pay whatever it takes because it's a competition. It's. It's the NBA. You look, the owner, the owner of the Mavs and the owner of the 76ers, neither one of these guys want to go look at the other other in the eye and say, dude, my facility that I have my guys in that bring me billions of dollars a year is some trash. Like they no, that's not how that works. Because because again, every artist, this goes for every artist, no matter you're signed or unsigned, the moment you let that record out into the world. Your competition is everybody that put a record out that day. That's well, your competition, starting well, from the bottom to the top. That is that yeah. is that's a fact of our life in in this in this business. So I always look and go, well, how much are you willing to pay to compete? Because if, again, you want to start an NBA team, you want to get to the finals, you want to win a championship ring, right? Well, how much do you think that's going to cost? And if you're not willing to pay that cost, well, then by all means, you should do what everybody else does. Sit down and enjoy the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that one. <laughs> it's, it's, down because it's, it's the, it's the truth say. of the reality of it. Hey, look, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to your favorite park and go play basketball. Right. I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you, you told me you're good. I think you're great. You should go for tryouts. But I can't force you to go try out for a team. Only you can wake up that day, say that I'm great, get on that bus, get in your car, train or walk to that tryout and have the faith that you and your skill level can take you to the level and the place that you feel you deserve to be in. Only you can do that. But that's a decision that was made before I came into the picture. I can root you on, but I can't shoot the shot for you. Right. But once you're in, once you're on the court, once you're in the game, well, welcome to the league, baby. Because we're all trying to play for a championship. We're all trying to win the championship ring. And that's and the I thing. That's the hardest thing. It, it's not getting into the championship, but staying in the championship. That's right. Because you got to, you got, look, man, winning a title is hard. Coming back again to win it again is harder. <laughs> and keep yes. doing it is harder because the reality is you have to compete on that level forever until you can no longer compete on that level that's the reality of it and it's it really sucks to say that 
because for some people it's a defying moment like no i don't have to do that and i've seen people do it for less and blah blah you have but i've seen really crappy teams make it to the finals too it don't happen a lot it doesn't it just yeah. doesn't it doesn't so the reality is are you trying to be the one in the million or are you trying to play the game get have your skill on on showcase and take your team to the finals like you know that you can it, it's it's a very simple thing don't don't win i don't win by luck i win because every single day i'm in the gym working out this skill that i have yeah. i'm here every day i was going to ask you that i was going to say what's the common denominator of all these champions they practice they're obsessed they show up every day every single day day in and day out and i know will like I don't care what time of day. I'll call Will. You we're know where I'm at. Just so we're all clear. Even Everyone. in this conversation, let's not be, let's, this is 200 tracks we're looking at, okay? Let's not, let us not play the game here. I am always working. I am literally always working. Come on, go flex, Will. Flex. <laughs> yeah, look, the, the desk, <laughs> let's see that console. Let's see that baby. Let's go to that console. Yeah. Nice. Sweet. Look at that. I, listen, I, I I come I come to play the game because I want to win a championship. That's I'm dead serious. That's that is 100 percent how it was always presented to me. No matter where we go, and this is just my control room. Look, it, Rob Rob knows my booth is bigger than, than my control room. <laughs> we we filmed we filmed but eight podcasts there in one day. We put in some work that day. It was like a 13 hour day. Dude, we were on live all day from four all different day. phones and accounts. Wow. We <laughs> stupid that day. It was crazy. That was a fun day, man. Dude, but but it's the but it's like that's like I like I said, that's the that's the truth of of how it's supposed to be in our industry. We're all competing. Like no matter how friendly we all are, look, you guys are amazing and I love my community of engineers. But we are, we're all competing. I I want my artists to to be the best. I want your artists to be the best. You know what I'm saying? I root for all my people that I know because the reality is we're all working our asses off. Excuse my language because I know how TikTok is. But we're really working to really get to the top to help the people that pay us to stay there. Like, I want an artist, I want a young artist that I'm working with to grind it out and get there. Proper management, great marketing, a label that believes in them. And these are all, look, fairy tale or not, it does happen. And it happens a lot more often than most people um, like really think of it to happen, but it does happen. And when you're a part of it, you see it because we all put the work in, you know what I'm saying? Like even, even when people are like, man, I can't stand this artist. You have no idea how much work behind the scenes they put in just for, just for you to get that final product of a, of a, of a vinyl, <laughs> of a stream. Okay. So, hey, yeah. Let's don't touch vinyl. Let's don't touch vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, look, you know the hey, thing look, is, I'm old enough to remember cutting vinyl, and I'm old enough to remember going, "I hate this." I'm I'm old enough to remember going, "I hate tape." I I'm <laughs> old enough to remember saying that just to see people go, "What's your favorite tape plugin?" And I'm like, <laughs> "The real thing. <laughs> the, the one that doesn't mess up my fingers." That's <laughs> what I. <laughs> You know, and I, I want to say this real quick because Will, that, that was beautiful too, the way you put it. And and as we're talking, right, HB text me, and I just want to like give this perspective to most people because I could understand how intimidating it must be. I remember how intimidating it was when I was first starting out. Like, looks like we all own rocket ships and fly to Mars every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just want to say this is that there's people like Will, there's people like HB, Isaac, Tom, Christian, Brian. Brandon, all our, all my friends, they are super willing to help and have these types of discussions. Like, do not be shy. You know, reach out. Like, try to network. You know, pick people's brains. Hire engineers. Like, I'm, I'm telling you right now, this is like the start to how you get really good. And, and at the end of the day, like, building relationships is so important to me. And it's not about money. Mostly, it's about sharing knowledge and ideas. And, and, and if I were to like credit most of my growth it came from meeting y'all like you know i've been doing this a long time too but like i would say in the past like four years like i i hit like this massive just you know just incline of growth and it was me like finally reaching out and and networking and and putting myself out there and you know i just want to say that like for anybody that thinks you know 
I couldn't even possibly work with anybody like you or whatever. You know, if, if you're living with those thoughts, don't, you know, reach out, network. Well, and, and if I could say something real quick, I mean, I, that's why I put out, you know, once a month, I want to help young artists, young engineers, young producers by doing a free mix. And all artists have to do is just submit something to me just so I can take a listen to it. And in that month, I will pick a song. I will do content here live uh, where I'm teaching, going through my process of what I'm listening for, how I'm hearing, you know, uh, the type of decisions I'll make um, because I want to help people. And then at the end, the artist gets a, a free mixed song. They get the Pro Tool session. And then that way they can look at it and see what did he do? What was he using? How did he get there? You know, what, you know, why did, you know, let me turn off all the plugins and see what they sounded like. What did the original sound sound like? What happens when I turn this plugin on, that plugin on? What was it, you know, that he was, his mind was going through? And that's why I offer that because I just, I know where I was when I was young. And, 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 and William, and you look really young. So for you to say that you remember <laughs> tape, kind of makes me go, huh. So, so, I so I am, so I, I am a, I am a young 40 turning 41 this year as well. Oh, so but see, I'm 49. Young 40. Yeah, okay. I'm going to take that one as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a young 40. <laughs> 40 so so, if somebody asks me, I'm young 40. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I, I, hang out, I hang out around nice a lot one. of rappers. That's why I hang out around a lot of rappers. So, so starting out for me, you know, engineers would not give you information. I mean, back in the day, it used to be like, you, you couldn't tell, you know, where it was recorded, you know, what engineers were mixing it, you know, all that stuff was secret back in the day, mm -hmm. you know? And so now, you know, it, for me to get information, to get knowledge, I would go, I mean, I also mix live sound. So I do touring and all that kind of stuff. When I would go to try to learn from engineers that were mixing a show, they would just go, hey man, get away. Hey, don't, don't bother me. Yeah, it just and they would push you away. So I would have to sit on the side and just watch what they were doing. Pay attention to what was you know being done when he was tweaking a knob, all that sort of stuff. And so I wanted to you know with with the the internet and all that kind of stuff. I was like, I want to be a resource for people. I want to help people. I want people you know if if you're an artist, you know, uh, Christian, you said earlier about you know you, there used to be a filter, right? You know, if you were good, you were you were going to make it, you were going, you were going to move forward, you were going to invest the money. But I want to help people at least figure out like, is this something that they want to do? Like I, you know, even I, I loan people gear, like, hey, hey, here's, here's a little rig for you to go with, go see if this is something you want to do. And if it's something you want to do, then understand there's going to be an investment into it. So like, you know, I'm here, all these people are here. I mean, fantastic. I'm, I'm learning a lot from you guys. Because my mindset was always, again, from being old, <laughs> I'm probably the old guy in the room. You're you're uh, a young 49. Look, you're <laughs> <laughs> but you know it, it. Just this, you guys have presented some new stuff for me to even think and 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 I really appreciate you guys. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. You guys continue I'm, on. So I'm gonna actually talk a little bit more about Isaac because I've joined his lives a few times and I think it's cool that you're offering free mixes, and and he takes it a uh, a little further. Like at least the last one you did, you had him come into your box. I, I joined yeah. that live and you're breaking down the mix to him and you're bouncing ideas off. And I just think that that right there is such a, a beautiful thing to see on TikTok. And like you just like randomly selecting someone, you know, you don't yeah. know what you're getting in and taking on that job. And it sounded killer, by the way. But that's what's cool is like, please go give uh, Isaac Kingdom a, a follow. Um, cause he goes live. I don't, I don't know how, how often you do it, but daily. Well, I, I've, I've kind of, this is all new to me going live. And to be honest, because I've, can I, I'm just gonna be totally honest with you guys. I've always felt that I was never good enough. Even all the stuff that I've worked on, right. Mm -hmm. I still have that imposter syndrome. I do too. I do too. Oh, we all do. Look, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm literally doing, a, this is, this is a song for a record label. I still do. <laughs> and, and you're sweating a little bit while you're doing I mean, it, right? Like, like, I've worked with, you know, I've done stuff for Lucasfilm, right? I've done stuff for Marvel. I've done stuff for D Disney, uh, DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, you know, worked with John Mayer. I've, you know, I turned down a gig for Ed Sheeran. I've, you know, like, I've, like, <laughs> I'm in this world, but I still feel like I'm not good enough. Even listening to Christian, <laughs> how he had his stuff laid out. No, I was it's like, like Yo, I'm not even smart enough to even do that. Like, <laughs> I, can, I can put mixes together, but like, 
to assemble the studio that way? Like, yo, like, no, nah, I need somebody else to do that for me so I can walk in and just mix. I feel like very bad right now because I don't know what I'm doing here, guys. You're so <laughs> your ears, your ears in front of me. I don't know what I'm doing here. So. Yeah. Oh, you're fantastic, Christian. I love here. you, man. You're like Ooh. listen, like, like I said, <laughs> like I said, Dave Fensato said it the best. People pay us for our taste. And that's that's yeah. when you get to that point of your career, is when is that's when you know you're actually doing something well. Because it's not it's no longer about the mix. You're it, it's about the decisions you make. Yeah. All the decisions and 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 I'm going to go out on a limb here. Everybody here, when you mix your records, you're mixing it from that emotional space because that's what music that's what made us all fall in love with music in the first place that's what made us all fall in love with it there's an emotional space that after a certain amount of time and experience now you're you're mixing from ooh, this is going to sound great here because when 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 people hear it in their headphones and this it balances out over here yeah. now <laughs> it just it does this thing where we're going to use we i can look i can use a tremolo plugin on this because it's going to elicit this movement that I'm looking for because I feel like the song needs movement at this at this part. Yep. And I'm not doing it just because it's cool. I'm doing it because it makes me do something. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want. And that's the thing. That's when you get to the, the actual job of mixing. Mm -hmm. Because you know now it's not just making it sound good. We elicit this emotion further from the record that we got. That that's why look, this is why, like I said before, if for those that missed it. Thank God for every amazing recording engineer walking the earth because you give us, again, you give us the ingredients to make these incredible dishes. And then you, again, and look, thank God for all the great mastering engineers, because let me tell you, look, I, I, I'm a, look I worked in a kitchen for seven years, so I'm, I'm a, and I'm a foodie. So it's like, me, yeah, you, me too, me too. I worked, I worked in the kitchen what? when I was in UK. I, say, I love food. I love food. So you know, so you know, look, listen, the person at the window before the food goes out, it's their job to make sure that the, before the food goes out, that the plate is perfect. Everything looks good, smells good, is presented well, and then the servers come and take it to the table. That's mastering to me. That's mm. their job because because they don't I have to go recook it. Right. But if something's wrong, they need to go tell, hey, this this is this is not good. This is bad. You see what I mean? And that's and, and that's the way the system of a restaurant works on a busy night. Hey, we cook the food. Hey, we plate the food. The plate looks good. Take it out to the table. Any issues? What does the client do? They're gonna come back and tell you. Right. And is that? And is, where's that? Where's that an issue at? Is it at? Is it at the the beginning phase for the ingredients? Oh, so we got to re-record this and add a, add a new line. Hey, you got to do that. Hey, is it in the mixing phase? This might be a little too loud, and we can't really take it out in mastering. Cool. Go back to the mixing. Yep. Hey, the mastering engineer. Hey, we're missing a garnish over here. We need. We need. I, I want a. I want a nice, pretty top end, and we do it in mixing, but it just starts. It gets a little too harsh. Can you? You know, give a little bit of uh, a little bit of shine to it. I got you, and that's how we get. That's how we get a dish that looks amazing. That, I that's where build, the stars come from. That's I want where to build on, on what Isaac just said. Um, sharing your knowledge with people on TikTok, I think, is a win-win situation because, mm -hmm. on the first hand, you help other people grow because what's yours, nobody can take away. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can. I can screenshot the exact channel strip that I'm using on my record and give it to five people, it will come out in five different ways with yep. the same channel strip, same plugins, yep. same gear, right? Yes, someone's going to bypass it by accident. <laughs> yes, <laughs> correctly. <laughs> and uh, the other win situation is that by doing this type of lives, you also, by accident, get people that are doing the same thing you, you're doing and you learn always new stuff, yeah. you know? and you networking that's the solution i don't think you can be a, a loner in this industry i think networking is the thing that brings you from the mid stage to the pro levels yep you only playing with the pros you can become a pro mm -hmm. i cannot so i don't think just sitting here with, with my board gear and doing my stuff i can become a pro ever just by playing with the pros right and by playing with the pros, I mean watching you doing your stuff, explaining, getting in touch, asking questions. That's where you level up. Yeah. Because 
you can read five books, but you cannot read experience, right? And that's what the pro gives you. He yep. saw that a hum, when you have a hum, you don't wonder where, where it's that hum coming from. Well, the book says it's, you know, the table <laughs> is correct. And, you know, but the pro will tell you, dude, you have some wiring with some electricity near your cable. Remove <laughs> that first, right? Well, or you, have, or you a, have your cell phone real, blocked too close real, to or your cell phone is blocked. No, 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 no. A, a, real, a, real professional, a real professional is going to tell you, hey, dude, turn that off on your Waves plugins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that was hate. That was pure hate. <laughs> yeah, that's pure you know, that's pure if, if you call if you call Verizon, right, and you say yep. I don't have internet, the first thing that guys ask you is it plugged? You know, it's like a basic question: <laughs> is it plugged in? <laughs> Great. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's true. The whole waves thing. Where is this his coming from? Oh, dude, it, it's a it, and you and you know what it was. I'll say this. I, look, and I have a couple of Waves plugins that I love truly. It, right. Waves plugins that had that that had that like the noise. Right. It was like a, it, was, it was like a menace for a ten years. <laughs> it, was, it was a menace, dude. It like everybody so... would be like, "Where is this coming from?" This and that, dude. Those eleven seventy sixes, those CLA seventy oh. sixes, and two A's, yeah. boy. They oh, were man. terrible. You hear me? And then you put on two and three, and it starts stacking the hits. Right. You're like, and you're just like, louder. you hit the stop button, and all you hear is, <laughs> yeah, the whole time. <laughs> and they're like, I don't know where it comes from. You start bypassing whole plug-in stacks, yeah. and then you start realizing, holy crap, it's every eleven seventy six I have in the session. <laughs> It took us ten years to figure that yeah, out, but we yeah, got Wave, it. Wave started started shipping the plugins with it turned off. Now that's why, and I was just like, "Come on, dude!" You, <laughs> oh man, that's so true. A funny thing, I need to tell you guys this. Uh, Tom and I, we have both uh, same uh, friend of us. It's a uh, acquaintance uh, that also is doing has gear and you know uh, a little bit of gear. Doesn't have a lot of gear, but has some bearing gear. So with that, I just said the level of gear right so Beringer and um, he used to have an artist in his studio and he was tracking the artist directly into his door right no outboard gear and the artist uh, asked him uh, oh you have a preamp from it has lots of lights you know the Beringer that has lots of lights <laughs> does lots of noise but it has <laughs> lots of lights and uh, he said yes can you track me through that? And he said, that will cost you an extra 50 euros. And she, she said, yes, of course, why not? <laughs> and he didn't just, he didn't even plug the preamp into his computer. He just left it unplugged, but with lights on. And he said, now you're tracked to the hardware gear. And she said, it was uh, amazing difference. <laughs> was like, <laughs> so he said, having the right customer, it just needs to power up your gear. It doesn't need to be connected. <laughs> be powered up. Oh man, dude, there was you know, there was a company the like that. There was a company like that back in the day, like 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 literally like five seven years ago, and that's what they did. They just made the face plates with for like fake gear, and you just hit the little power button on it, and it was just oh, lightless. Really? Actually, they're, they're actually, oh my god, there was a company that said that things were tube. But the tube was there was nothing routed to the tube. They just illuminated the tube with an LED light. Oh, that's probably. Oh Behringer. my God, we probably Behringer. It's <laughs> probably Behringer. It probably was. was. Like, and look, look, look I, I love, I, love, <laughs> I love my 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 compressor pro. Like it was like twenty six hundred or whatever from Behringer. I love that compressor, but it had like a little tube stage button on it. Yeah. It was just an orange light. There's not a yeah. tube in there for nothing. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you the psychological feeling of a right. tube. And, <laughs> yep. and you know what? Sometimes that's what you they, need to get through a they record. Were yeah, they were really smart from the uh, the guys from the bearing up because they knew that it can manipulate you like psychologically. When you turn that button on, when it says like tube, your brain will compensate for that sound. Yeah. For the tube <laughs> sound. Listen, I, I can, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But so, I, I can't tell you how happy I was when when Behringer bought Clark, like well, oh, Clark Technic. Yeah. Because, dude, that now that's probably some of the best budget gear I've ever seen on the market. For sure. <laughs> like, be, because it's like. 
you can get this pull tech for like 200 something bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and guess what? It's actually it's gonna do the job. It's not it's not gonna sound good. like a two pull tech, but it's definitely mm-hmm. gonna do a pull tech. Like mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a good point. It's not gonna do a pull tech, but it's gonna sound like a pull tech. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when they when they had um their their Clark eleven seventy six and Clark two A are probably two of the cleanest compressors I had ever used, and I had used them in conjunction with each other on so many projects. People were surprised. That whole chain of them together was five hundred bucks. Jeez. And but but they sounded incredible. Like their eleven seventy six is the cleanest eleven seventy six on the market, and that's a lot because if, if you've ever used an eleven seventy six, you know you start cranking that input up, that noise floor is, is coming. Mm-hmm. For it, it's coming. <laughs> There's dude, you crank that up, and it was just dead silence. Like dude, I, I'm like okay, I don't know, I don't know if I'm getting punked here. I don't know if this was an accident. But it's a plugin. It's a plugin running. There's a mini Mac in the back. There's a Mac right. in the back of this thing. <laughs> but like my but favorite yeah. one is my favorite one is um that 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 compressor you've been tweaking for five minutes is bypass. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, dude. I mean, we're getting back and release, right? And like the whole time, it's bypass. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Our eyes you know, are it's the same. Defeated. It's the same thing when you're talking on the phone, right? Because somebody's you're on the phone on the mobile, and the other person saying, "I cannot hear you. You don't have reception," and you're just staying for one second in the same point. You don't even move and say, "What about now?" Yeah, now it's working. <laughs> it's the same oh, the phone never moves. Right? So, so James says the real one can be quieter. Aging filter cap, right? Yeah. Here's the problem. You start changing some of those caps, you change the sound of it. Yeah, it changes the whole sound. Right. It changes, yeah. the, whole changes sound. the whole sound. It does yep. yep. You got to relearn the gear and everything. It really yep. does. Like I, I had a, I had an eleven seventy six, and I changed the tubes on it, and I hated it. I hated it, and I'm like, and and I couldn't get my other tubes back, and like I'm like, I ended up selling it because I you just didn't like the sound. What's that? You said two way or seventy six? No, my Avalon. I'm sorry. Oh, he said he said two's on a seventy six. Oh man, you must have got a yeah. Stan audio seventy six. Yeah, he yeah, got, no, no. yeah, some I special have, mod. Avalon seven three seven. Um, back in the day, actually, I, I sold it probably three years ago. My Avalon seven three seven, and I put about that dude. Yeah, I put a. I can't remember the tubes now, but supposedly they're supposed to like you know give a better better sound and whatnot. And I'm like. I don't know what it was. I'm like, I don't even like it anymore. There's just something off. And maybe it, like I was biased to the sound because I was so used to it. But yeah, that's what happens when you swap out stuff. That It changes the whole sound of it. It really uh, does. I, look, perfect. I love that example because it, it goes with this one. So I have a tube tech here, right? And it took me about a month, maybe, maybe almost a month and a half. Um, remember when I, when I went through this, um, Rob? I, 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 the tubes were going bad. In it. Remember I was looking for replacement tubes? Mm-hmm. And everybody oh, under the sun that. is telling me to put all the most expensive tubes in the world in this thing because no one could tell me for the life of me what tubes were in it. Like, <laughs> the website, nobody could tell me anything. Wow. I called my Sweetwater rep. Okay, for those that don't understand, so a tube tech, especially right now, a hardware tube tech right now, they're a year out. And if you get a used one, it's like four or five grand. Right? So I've had mine for like, what, two years, maybe three years now, right? Dude, the tubes in here are literally twenty dollar tubes. They are like the cheapest tubes you can buy on the market. <laughs> They're not new old stock. They're not old stock. They are literally the cheapest tubes on the market. My God! Wow. Like I mean, my sweet water rep literally called me back laughing. <laughs> You were running from like, Chinatown. Like, China like, <laughs> They're like like Sylvania, and I'm just like, what did you take? He goes, dude, I. Will, I'm going to ship you these tubes right now. It's right, for how free. Much is it gonna cost? No, I'm just going to send what? these to you. It's for free. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, what? Plop them in? Wasn't, <laughs> it, though, wasn't it like the power supply or something that it ended up being the problem? Am I am I off on this no, or was that, that was, a that was the um That was the, um, the 800. So the... Got you. <laughs> so so yeah, you had the problem. Yeah, I remember. The 800. That. Dude, okay. Because of that, and, and, it, and it wasn't even that. You know what the problem was? One of the tubes just wasn't pushed in all the way. That's, That's it. what it was. Yeah, you're so, like, I just had to push the tube in. That's so what it was. They sent me two more tubes. Um, Who was it? Jim. I got Jim Jacobson. He gave me like three or four tubes. I ended up buying some other tubes. And then 
when I took the, I took it to Jim to check it out instead of sending it back, he was just like, oh, was this the problem? And no oh, way. wow, it sounds great. What did you do? Yeah, the tube was just loose inside the power supply. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Again, for future reference, in a, in a C800G, if you're hearing noise, you have to check the mic itself and the tubes in the power supply, okay? Dude, it was loose. I now have eight Sony tubes in my closet. <laughs> you understand? Just in case. Like, they're just chilling there. <laughs> do, do, do. Like, they're going to become new old stock by the time I'm old enough to right. replace it. <laughs> But you said you have the tube tech. You have the 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 real deal, or do yeah, you have oh yeah, a, it, right here. There you go. Very flex. Yep. Yeah. Great stuff. Question. Answer. For me to replicate the tube tech, but without having a tube tech, <laughs> was always the idea. <laughs> I get this question all the time. I promise. But you get what I'm trying to go there, right? So to get there, but not having that, right? Uh, would it make uh would it uh, a CLA f no sorry uh 1176 followed by a CLA 28 do the same trick basically um, in the box or out for it uh, out of the box yes so so, so 1176 so from so I have the warm audio ones because yeah so here's the weird I thing had the initial. my remember I was telling you before about the Clark Tech so I had that I again I recorded everybody independent artists label artists everybody with that combo it sounded incredible what I did, I used the, um, and this is a real thing for anyone that's listening and watching this. I used the Dr. Pepper settings on my 1176, <laughs> which is the attack at three o'clock, the release yep. itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, my one guy used to work back, like, look, this, again, I'm showing my age here. One of my friends from back in the day from um, the Pensado students Facebook page, he worked for Bruce, um, Bruce Swedeen. And <laughs> Bruce would always come in and drop little hints. I remember there's a thread on Pensado students. It's old as dirt. So if you could find it, it this will be great for you. What up? Yo. <laughs> um, so everybody's here. Of course, of course. So he, he, he I remember he told me they used to always record well, this is after Bruce made the comment about the whole thing with compression. Um, but he was like, We always love recording through an eleven seventy six on a twenty to one settings, just kind of tapping down anything that just might get a little crazier out of hand and that's what i would do for my settings i would just turn it up and i would just catch 1176s when it's doing like 5 10 it, it's like it's always in fives 5 10 15 20 dbs 20 at the yeah. max like we're talking screaming gold. but on that average like that that two to five and that five to ten sound great and you can't hear it invisible as hell and then going into the um the, the clark technic 2a what i the clark technic 2a sounded great i got rid of the opto cell and replaced it with the black lion opto cell instead oh. i've seen that i've seen and, that on youtube and, People and yes saying, How do you replace look, listen that? listen the hype is real yes yes that combo with those settings and because with the with the 2a it never i never had it going more more than two to three db ever the 76 did all the heavy lifting, the <laughs> just massage, yep, yep, the Clark Technic 2, it was just massaging vocals, and I'm 100% going to tell you that opto cell changed everything, because when we changed that opto cell, we kept the settings, when I changed that opto cell out, holy crap, and I know I know the internal settings for the opto cell are setting the attack and release, whatever they have set in that opto cell, beautiful, it was beautiful, and it just... Um, I replaced the the tubes. So you said five hundred dollars of that was that chain? Uh, that, yeah, it's, it's literally five hundred oh, okay. bucks. But, yeah. but like, no, no, you know what? Okay, so because the opto cell, <laughs> it, it would ultimately come to like six hundred and some change because the opto sure. is ninety nine dollars. Yeah, because that one hundred makes a difference. <laughs> yeah, but the opto cell really made the biggest difference. That chain yeah. is the only thing I would really compare to my to my two tech, and I've had five hundred series that that came close I, i've had a lot of things but that combo was the closest thing to my one tube tech cl1b it it yeah, just guess. it just did it because like with the cl1b it's the same thing it it gave me the same it gives me the same range like the 1176 but <laughs> but the fact that i can go 20 db and you don't hear it like after that 20 yeah you hear it but like when it's just when it's just kissing it, no, you you'll never know. 
Like you'll look, you'll look at the waveform. You'll never know that this thing got touched by 20 dB of gain reduction. It just looks yeah. good. It sounds good. The attack, it's like, it's an idiot box compressor, to be honest with you. Yeah. Like myself, I have three other engineers that'll come in here every once in a while and do tracking and stuff. We all switch the settings. We all get the same freaking sound. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, cause you can't go wrong. And it's like, whatever mic you want, right? Well, like 800, C12, 47, going into the 1073 and then into that, It mm. it's, that's it. Like that's the it. The background of my question is because I have like the 1176 and that's my chain. 1176 then followed by CLA 2A. By 1176, I go two, two, two or three dB gain reduction. And on CLA 2A, I actually go more. I actually go like seven. I'm going seven on the 2A. But I'm also figuring, um, thinking about getting the Worm Audio uh, Tube Tech version mm -hmm. or replica because based on the reviews i've read and heard it doesn't seem to be a huge difference between those two it's it, pretty good build it doesn't sound put it this way so the the <laughs> C, the cl1b two tech and the warm audio two tech sound different the reason why everyone loves the warm audio two tech is because it actually sounds good though it's it's one of those it's half it's, the price yeah, yeah you know what i'm saying like <laughs> that price anyway half, look, half the price no, not even half the price. Shoot, at this point, it's like a Wait, third. These people are crazy right here on Reverb right now. A, yep. a third the price, and on, on top of that, it it has this beautiful low mid bump that just mm. sounds really good. And then I got I know I know two people that got the mod for it um, from from MFC, and yeah, <laughs> it it sounds damn near like my tube tech. It, I'm talking like, look, this it came. It put it this way: the mods makes it sound like that's just a different tube tech. Same CL1B just came out and got manufactured a month after mine, maybe, maybe the next day. Same line. Hell, this one was done in the morning. This one was done at night. It, <clears throat> if that's the case, save the money, go get that one, get and then go get it modded. If you really, really want it to be like my tube tech, you're yeah. going to get the same action, the sound and the character of it. It's going to be there. The mod will get it there. If you get it unmodded, you won't you won't not like it. Put it that way. Okay, thank you. That was the it's question because I just want, I want to bump from my chain to a, not the same thing, but a bump up. And that's... what do you have for your preamp? Uh, the SSL board. I have the SSL board, and I also have the need. What from well, I will say that the uh, man. Listen, I will tell you right now. The Neve and the and the CL one B. It's not the Neve. It's the replica of the Neve. From it doesn't matter. Video. It doesn't matter. I've I've had like four clones in here. <laughs> Rob knows. I've had, <laughs> I I don't have a lot of Neve clones in here, dude. They they're all they all sound great going into the CL one B. They there's there's something about the Neve character that marries very well with this compressor. Yeah. And like I, I've had I've had APIs. Um. Phew, oof. I'm not gonna lie, the API was 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 sweet, but but the Neve and the Tube Tech lets you go, but lets you pick whatever microphone you want, while those two don't have to change. Yeah, like they keep the bottom end, and it's it's there's a there's a there's a there's a solidness to the low end of the vocal, but it's not boomy. It's just like it's just like yeah, this is a vocal. Yeah, and I like, put it on my wish list that you pick <clears> the from all the model one, but don't do uh, not your wife for this year because list. yeah, because that's what I want to say because otherwise <laughs> I, she will divorce me. <laughs> I just bought a so console and she will mm -hmm. beat the shit out of me. So <laughs> keeping in the wish list, but yeah, thanks for the advice. That's something on my list definitely. Oh, not a problem, man, dude. I, I mean, as you can see, I'm look. I'm I'm I I am at a place where most where most of our our brethren don't get to. I'm at the end of my gear journey. Okay. I am not out here looking for the next piece. I know, I like, <laughs> look, dude, sell stuff. Like, <laughs> offload. Dude, I'm uh, look. Let me tell you, it that was a, that's a hard journey to be on. <laughs> it is. Mm -hmm. There's, a, there, you know, a fun fact about the the two A. You could utilize it as a preamp, and that freaking thing sounds great. It sounds great as a preamp. So th that that there's two uses for it. And I, uh, who was it? Um, Gregory, I think. I always forget his name. I, I've talked to him a few times here on TikTok. He did a video on it. And I think he had the scam. But um, 
I did it. I put it on my beta 58 and I just did it just shits and giggles just to mess around. And I'm like, holy crap, this thing sounds so damn good. Like just in the preamp. I'm like, I actually almost prefer to use it as a preamp rather than a compressor now. That's just something to kind of think about. That's fire. But see, that's what that's what I'm saying. Like when Behringer bought like Clark, that was probably one of the best moves they could have ever done. Like their the pieces they got from Clark. I I still have the Clark, um what is it? What is what is what is that um little pitch? little box that they had um oh, oh my god what it, help help me out here it's it's uad plug-in version of it it's got it's got four buttons the first button's red it does pitch and modulation help the me studio out. chorus is that yeah, yeah like the the d um, what's it called um dimension d yeah, yeah. dimension d yeah so gotcha. so clark did their own version of the dimension d it sounded so good sweetwater so so let me let me give you the look the, the history on this stupid thing real quick right it was a $300 unit. Sweetwater got it messed up and the, they dropped the price from from 300 to 60 bucks. No oh way. God. And they couldn't figure out why they were selling so many oh. units. <laughs> I wasn't I there for that? I know. Like, where when was they, I? When, when they figured it out, like, dude, I, so I got one because my boy was like, if you don't like it, it's 60 bucks. If you do like it, it's sixty bucks. Right. <laughs> it's just sixty bucks, dude. I, I've still never used this piece ever. It has literally been sitting in my closet. <laughs> and I refuse to sell it because in my mind, I'm like, who else is making a Dimension D clone out here? Right. Right. No one. Yeah. No, yeah. Literally. Not, no, not for sixty bucks. <laughs> dude, look, look. My kids one day are gonna be like, "What's this?" And someone's gonna be like, "I'm gonna buy it." <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy it. How much you gonna buy it for? I'll buy it for like five hundred right now. <laughs> yeah, like that was a doorstop. You know? <laughs> dude, dude, it, it like I, I always do this for all my gear now. Um, after getting the um the grace, I always look inside the guts of gear now, and let me tell you, that tells the tale of how 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 much a company cares about their like their products. Yeah, the inside. Oh, dude, <laughs> it wasn't nothing in this box. They could have made this into like a, a they could have made it into a dual 500 series and everyone would have been happy. <laughs> I was like, they spent you know, more money on Christmas. the metal than they did the. You know, on Christmas when you go like this to shake the box to kind of yeah. get the idea. That's what I felt like. I felt like if I shake this thing, I'm going to break this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that stuff's for real, though, with like, you know, I mean, it, in a price of something obviously there's there's demand that drives a price but there is a big difference you know when you're getting even probably some of the warm stuff and that you're know, um budget friendly i think that's the proper way of describing <laughs> it it's not cheap it's budget friendly uh but like yeah they'll 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 get like the main guts to get the the tones but when you start feeling the knobs and things like that uh mm -hmm. You start like squeezing on the rack. It's like it's really thin aluminum. Dude, yeah. these knobs are loose neck babies, yo. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you ever like you know the if you remember True Systems? Oh yeah. The yes. Precision eights. Those things had like machined aluminum knobs, and it was just like yeah. you would grab yep. them, and it felt like oh yeah, this is this is yep. gear, you know, and it just like mm, metal. You know, yeah then you like grab something else that has like even like the like when the 610s or the, the 6176s and stuff came out, <laughs> and you grab it but it's like oh yeah, it's, it's like it's like it's like the size knob. of an orange yeah you didn't have enough <laughs> resistance where like you would turn it and it feel like it would you would stop moving it and then it would still go you know just yeah. you, know, like, you gotta get the you gotta get the right settings then then tape it down and don't blow on it because it might <laughs> tell you i'm warning you right now you go mess with the tube tech it ain't none of that going on look you yeah, yeah. You, you flip the, that knob, was, it is. <laughs> what are the, we uh, need the knobs like, that strengthen the grip strength? Yeah. Oh, dude, look. Oh. Some of that stuff is like uh, for the tube tech for the like the pre's. Uh, aren't those have those have detents? Yes. On there? So like yeah. like there are. Let's see, one, two, three, four. There's four knobs that that are um detented, and the others are just literally loose, loose as hell. Like you're just. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Like you're you're flicking. Right. <laughs> yeah. These are the second hands on a on a watch. Just playing the lotto. Just spinning yeah. with Dude, like, hands on. That's what is that doing. a price is right thing where they're just yep. spinning the you know. yep, that's a hundred. Um the, now, the, now Neves, you know the Neve one. Look, the, the big red Neve knob, man, look, that yeah. that again, no matter I, I have yet to feel 
one that just kind of feels cheap. Even the warm audio one is like you're clicking it and it's just yeah. like it's like snap, it's perfect. snap, yeah, snap, snap. Mm-hmm. like yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's the that knob is gonna get there before you get there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Sure. You know what I mean? And it's like, but but it's like that great that's the thing about gear, it has that great feeling. Or it's like, or it, even if the knobs are loose, if if the knob is big enough, no one cares. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Have another one for you guys. Patch pay cables. Uh oh, Jesus and, Christ. You know, <laughs> I mounted the patch pay and I don't have any cables. So uh I was browsing. And I found out something that I haven't heard of it, and I don't understand why it's so expensive. It's called Hosa. Oh God, what the brand? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no. Hosa. No. TTS eight three zero. Just get off the page. Get one hundred thirteen <laughs> euros. What? Yes. Let, let me wait, wait, wait. How, how, maybe how it's, it's got to be. Maybe it's a European import thing, but like, yeah, Hosa is kind of like the. Hosa is the Behringer for cables out here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's the Timu of cables. Oh yeah, facts. No, you could probably go to Timu and get better cables. So, um, you know what? Let me just... <laughs> like, <flip> my... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, going yes, to Timu. Empty cart, empty cart. <laughs> <laughs> what, are we, what are we looking at here? Oh, oh no. patch cables. Oh. Oh, you, oh man, you got, you got the cable cables. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, those are the like what they're plastic ends. Yeah, yeah. The, the, 40, you see 40, that? Forty yeah. something dollars. Forty-four for that, from yeah. one hundred thirteen. Yeah, that's not too bad. What? Adam Hall is. I get ten cables for ten euros or something like that. <laughs> are we talking Hosa? Or are we talking hand built here? James said, "Hey, you can hire him. He'll make your cables for you." Look, James, James will probably up. use Canary or, or uh, Mogami yeah. or something. Use those Mogami, look, those Mogami connectors and call it a life, okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, uh, uh, you guys, the fur that are in the States, you guys use Redco at all? Craig, Chris Stubbs? Um, you know? I'm not going to hold you. I got a cable guy down in Florida that does all my stuff custom. Yeah. I, That's like, yeah, I think it's, I mean, I, I was pricing some stuff out, like, through, like, Redco with, like, for D-subs and Mogami cable and, like, Switchcraft or Neutrik ends and all this stuff. He just built me a, a ton of stuff, and I look at the exact same cable, even like at Sweetwater, like from Mogami with hey. Mogami cable and a Neutrik end, and it's literally twice the price. Yep. Like, oh my gosh. Building little cables, I'm fine with that. Like, I ain't gonna mess around like hand wiring and D sub connectors and stuff like that. Like, man, and throw, <laughs> uh, you know, not always do you throw money at the problem. But that's where you throw money at the problem. Like it's like more than likely one of the pins, I'll screw it up or it'll be a bad solder. Oh, uh, burn yourself like he's like, What's up with this ground connector? No, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> Just like, you know, have, have oh, somebody dude. do it. Like there there's there's a couple of good companies. I'm sure there's there's some good cable builders in Europe as well that yeah, you know, they just like that's their whole gig is they make stuff to order and it's they have the tooling already set up that you just sit there and tell them what you want in a couple of weeks you get Dude, the, the best thing you can done. do exactly the best thing you can do is find a custom cable company like like where of you course. are and and just build that relationship with them because dude they, let me tell you there is nothing like it like custom d look mogami d subs out here are yeah. like 300 starting and up look my guy in florida he's building custom d sub cables for me Gold tipped and everything, numbered per cable. Look, all they have names and numbers on them. <laughs> they have names and a <laughs> hundred something bucks, yeah. dude, and shipping yeah. it to me. I'm like, yeah, right, bro, I'm, never I'm going contacting back. your guy. <laughs> uh, look, my man Alan, he he is a whiz. All right, and it's gonna take like two weeks, and that's it. And it comes back perfect, beautiful. I, dude, I, he get. I got a fifty foot XLR for my mic in the booth, right? Uh-huh. All Mogami threaded cable, Jeez. and it like, and then on top of that, it's got that um, it's got he's got that um outer layer for the cable so it could be stepped on. Yeah, right. That thing cost me sixty bucks. My I said, God. I said, this is why I'm never going anywhere else. If you die, I pray you teach your children. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you look at what it costs, like you know, he, he's buying a spool. Yeah, you, know, you can buy like yep. Mogami quad the 250 foot or a thousand foot spool. And if that's your gig, I mean, you're going to run through that in no time flat. You have done some like, uh, 
installs and stuff like that where you're hang doing a bunch of hanging stuff in a theater and mm -hmm. you know you're, you're dropping 500 feet of cables to put like 10 points up you know it's got to go up in a catwalk and all this stuff but the the price per foot is so much cheaper you know buying it in bulk and i'm gonna buy 50 male connectors and 50 female gold neutric connectors mm -hmm. and it's like ends up being like a dollar a connector versus 10 bucks a connector when you're buying it as a one-off or and then they still have to build it and then to sell it to you through sweetwater sweetwater marks it whoever the distributor marks it up the, yep. the original company marks it up and then you're paying like yeah well, you're, you're a 50 foot you know sh like a uh armor cable that yeah you you'd spend 300 plus bucks yep you know to, to, to buy that you know online yeah dude i'm over here like nope i'm not doing that the longest sure. open the longest share, open your open open table. share your contact share your contact oh shoot, i got that's, you no no i got you does does he ship overseas as well <laughs> you know what i'd have to i i look i'll give you the number you hit him up yourself <laughs> yeah definitely hey, there's What's no one here of Spain Mall are you asking me? about he lives he in, probably he lives does in texas he's asking what's the best audio engineering school or production engineering school hey for me my opinion um this is just my opinion uh because the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences has been really good there in Tempe, Arizona. I've had a couple guys, like when I worked in the commercial recording studio that I did, I had actually a couple guys come in from Full Sail to uh, try to intern. And I felt that they weren't as prepared. Now, that was years ago. Uh, I felt that the guys from Full Sail were just not prepared. But the guys that came in from... Crass, uh, yeah. From, yeah, was, they were very well prepared. They... They, they seem to think more outside of the box than the guys from Full Sail did. That's just my opinion, but I just wanted to give Fade that uh, that information there because I know people are always looking, hey, where, where do I go to school for this stuff? So I'm going to definitely agree. And actually, I'm going to um, – I had that same experience when I went to um, help – See if I can find his cable guy. In Denver, um, one of the interns came in. He was from Full Sail, and I had that same perspective with him. I'm like, hmm. There's some things we got to catch up to speed on, you know, and like, yeah, yeah it was, and even the basics. Um, uh, it was like, well, I mean, basics. I, so we, we had a Neve 80 series console in, in the studio that we were in 1073 pre's, all that kind of, you know, um, 2254 compressors. And I sat the guy behind the console and I said, okay, what does this button do? And legit, these guys all said the same thing. I don't know what that button does, but the teacher told me to when to push it. I go, so you don't yeah. know what it does, but he told you when to push it. Yeah like push it now like okay but you don't understand what that button does and i was like that's that blows my mind you spent a lot of money to not understand at least the basic function of i think it was something like the phase button or something like that it was something super simple because i don't know why i needed to push it but he told me when to push it wow yeah, that's no good yeah okay. jams is on there it's like omega 2017 like i used to teach at omega for a little bit <laughs> small world <laughs> oh, yeah. oh okay so look i got it it is proaudiowiring.com. Pro audio. I'm, I'm writing it right now in our good old comment section. Okay, cool. I'd agree. <laughs> yep. And just tell them that I sent you. I, I want Williams prices. <laughs> I oh, want the dude. William deal. <laughs> so look, when I get the Williams sale dude. price. <laughs> just just tell him that I sent you and he'll he'll take care of you. Like, trust me, like I, I've been going to him for years now. My, my friend, um, um, K tracks, he sent me to him. Um, and he wired his whole studio. He's probably spent like 20 grand with him. And I was just like, dude, but like, when you see the back of his desk with his cable management, it was beautiful. And like, again, for anyone, for anyone that's a professional in our industry, saying someone has beautiful cable management that's a that's a high praise okay because we've seen Christian. my cable management today that wasn't pretty <laughs> dude look it it is spaghetti back here okay <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a spaghetti bowl you know what i'm saying so it's like he he showed it to me i was like whoa for real he goes he gives you the cables you'll get the velcro on it you everything it's all set up for you however you want it you can he'll number it he'll letter it word it you name it, whatever kind of connectors wow. you want. He'll even color it for you. I was like, oh, oh, yeah, I love it. Like, dude, I've got a 20 foot Mogami um, D sub connected. And on the other side of it, it is all, um, what is it, female XLRs? Because it's going to my um, 500 series rack and all the XLRs, the left ones are black, the right ones are all red. 
and they're numbered. I said, this, this is heaven. This is what heaven is like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's good too. There's like, there, there's more people in, in the space now doing that. Cause it man, what used to be like, you'd get whirlwind to make you some kind of thing or uh, like oh. audio accessories. Yep, I think they're, they're still, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and they're still in the game was, um, and yeah, Will, you're, you're up. I mean, like the, like RCI, they would do a, a bunch of custom mm -hmm. builds and custom panels, but that was like it, you know, there's like three or four names in the business and then you'd have to call them up and somebody have yep. to hand write down the order and you and then get back to you as far as how much that's going to cost. Six and, months later. Like I already moved oh. on, man. I've already moved on. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, no, no. I'm not moving nothing. Look, it's <laughs> at that month, that becomes the scariest month ever because now you have to break everything down to prepare to recable everything. Yeah. And then it's like the breakdown is probably the easiest part because you're just unplugging everything. But for okay, if you're a young engineer, you're unplugging everything, you're like, I'll remember where everything goes. <laughs> <laughs> As an older engineer, I'm over here with my phone, like, mm-hmm. Yeah. You have to take <laughs> I'm gonna take it from this angle so that way I know for a fact. <laughs> True story. True yeah, story. there's also like you see somebody some folks doing installs, and I think it falls into that cable porn. When you see like a real clean they, one, just oh, yeah. so everything is perfect. Everything's flat, all lined up like, together. And... Yeah, girl. Oh, like, you know. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Man, I, I, I love how you did the whole off access S on that cable, yeah. boy. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you go, man? You see that strain like relief? That. <laughs> Jeez. I need to jump off, guys. It was a pleasure. I need to run to the city. So oh, I'm man. It's all good, man. Same good to meet you, Tom. Good, good, good to meet you. you. Great meeting you, Tom, man. Thank you, Tom. Right, Tom. Actually, Thank you, guys. This is a, a perfect segue because um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, head out as well. But if if you wouldn't mind, Will. Yeah, what's up? And yeah. Isaac. Actually, yeah. I think we'll probably all do it. But I know that they've been waiting for studio tours. I think that's what it, that's the anticipation of this live is everyone wants uh, to yeah <laughs> hold on let me let it's me about let the me, gear let me see how let me see if i can flip some, this camera around real quick we need some in-depth studio tour all right you ready go for it all right I so just, let's let's start by the door because then i can work my way back okay so we've got yeah. the sa25m monitors the beautiful and not so crazy handsome audio zulu tape machine and we've got all of our fun gear here. Oh, uh, better maker in there. Grace oh, and yeah. The better maker that took my attention as well. Look, look, look. So when we're talking about knobs, right? The the most satisfying knob turn ever. <laughs> 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 it's like it's just enough resistance, like to let you know you're turning a knob, but right. not, but not so bad that it that it fights you every turn. Uh, of course, you know, turn off Nova. Of course, you know, I got gotta love that CL1B. Pure, pure two, amazing converter box. Love that. Mm. CLA tens because yes, <laughs> yes. I have the NS ten. So hey, look, same stuff. dude. If your NS ten ever breaks down, you can trust that those CLA tens are going to give you the same thing you just had. I promise you. Because I was, I was super hard and harsh on like these aren't going to sound like NS tens. They're not going to get nowhere near NS tens. I ate that humble pie. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, my beautiful C24. Um, so for anyone that, that doesn't know me, this is not Pro Tools. This is actually Reaper with a Pro Tools skin. So looks just like Pro Tools. I've got all the Pro Tools functionality plus all the craziness that Reaper lets me do. And because of that, this C24 is working through a, a program called V-Control. And it gives me literally all the options, scribble strips, you name it. I have. I can literally run all access of this board in Reaper. Well, man, Reaper as Pro Tools. Now that's something I didn't even see. Oh, dude, it's been amazing. Let me. Hey, I'm gonna have to ask you. How do you get? You, can you do uh, um, uh, plug-in control with the knobs and V V control? So no. It, well, as okay. far as I know, as far as I know, not on not on this setup with Reaper. But I think I can when I'm actually using Pro Tools because the C24. That's is where, where, that's where I'm struggling. I I have I have that issue. So yeah, as, as far as that goes, yeah. But you know what? Hey, look, tablet time. <laughs> Get the, I would say pull out the tablet and call it a life. Um, my my mix bus, 500 series, all 500 series stuff. 
color units for those crazy recordings that just aren't up to par, but I need to bring them up to par. Um, this is the Cayenne 4000, which is basically my SSL 4000 center section, so I can drive this bad boy as hard as I want to. Um, SPL Big, hardware stereo yeah. imager. Ultraviolet EQ. Violet. Hey, this, when when you need it, yeah, it's 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 great. Um, the classic SSL bus compressor. And of course, we've got our Audioscape 1073. This is a sleeper that only so many other professionals know and use. The 560? You already know. Well, yeah. this one, the 520, because, you know, 500 series, oh. the, the, the DSer, but. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That DS, sir? Yes. Um, so impressed by the plug and I end up getting it. So the little lab's voice of God, I got the two 500 units and I use this for my low end on the mix bus. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. Super crazy low end. Um, Sweet. And then, of course, my output knobs. So that way I can either turn the mix up or down if need be. And the brains of the Grace M905. Hold on. Let me... And of course, they would they would kill me if I don't. My custom soft tube console one with SSL knobs. And this is yeah. this is what Rob really wanted me to do. <laughs> Trying to get the mic collection. I'm not okay. letting you go until uh. I see the mic collection. All right, hold on. Don't and forget this. to show the cable management. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, don't look at that. Yeah. So Wait until you see this. Our good old 800 G. And then I said, look, don't look, don't look. <laughs> they had a podcast here last night. So, and of course, Sennheiser headphones for tracking the, and this is just my opinion. Yeah. One of the best headphone amps I have ever used. Those are great. This, holy crap. <laughs> yes. Yes to that thing. All right. Then of course the mic collection. This is my favorite part. C12, oh. um, 47, let me see, that's the 800. 67, 87. <laughs> Basically, um, yeah, I was going to say 87. Uh, <laughs> all of <laughs> oh, them. No, 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 hold on. Actually, you know what? So, because and, and I've, I've only done this with the guys when they came over. I'm going to do this only one time and one time only. So, what you are about to look at is a the custom, never before seen microphone ever. And I mean 100% custom. Yes, the case says MXL. Just know that it was an MXL when it got to him, not after. And I know you see what that number says. So, check PLM. out this beauty. 103, yep. TLM, yeah. You are looking at a custom. Custom, yeah. TLM 103 MXL box 2. Wow. So cool. Dude. That's awesome. This thing piece of jewelry it, uh, yeah, for men. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this this is probably so again tube microphone this thing sounds more like a 251 it sounds closer to the 251 than my c12 over there it is beautiful it re it reproduces so it's a tlm um capsule inside of it it reproduces a voice damn near as you as we hear it in real life jeez it is crazy it it might be the cleanest microphone i've ever used yeah it yeah that's <laughs> incredible this is a one of one it is yeah that yeah that my kids are gonna get that <laughs> <laughs> my children are gonna get that one day and be like i remember this and of course we have last but not least uh, I just couldn't get a bit. I couldn't get a better box for it. We have the custom um, JJ Audio 87 Bulldog with switchable 87 mic. So on this switch right here, it'll actually go from 87 Classic to 87 AI. Hmm. Dual capsule, both sides. Jeez. Yeah, this thing is nuts. <laughs> This on instruments, yes. Yeah, this, yeah. You, this, mm -hmm. this will, yeah. Your drum kit will love you for this, Mike. That's awesome. I was, in this case, I was 
go with the 103 with the TLC. Oh, uh, dude, let me tell you. <laughs> and then with that little jewelry. <laughs> it, it's pretty. And I pro it's, it's weird because people will see it and they'll be like, well, what's this little microphone? I'm like, you know, you're ready. You can step up to it whenever you're ready. Put the headphones on. They're like, holy, <laughs> holy crap, what is this microphone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like what they, is this? they literally go from making fun of it to literally asking me, where can I get one? I'm like, right. you can't. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> but yep, that is, that is, this is my home setup. And of course, uh, awesome. E ejected, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man. Oh, beautiful setup. Thank you, Will. Beautiful no, no problem. Setup. And I appreciate the time, man. Of course. Uh, uh, guys, I just want to take one one second before uh, Isaac sure. starts to show okay. you marketing go wrong <laughs> on on gear. <laughs> Have a look at this photo. I just give me one second. I will do it quick and fast. I I saw it the other day. What do you see wrong at that? Clean setup. Where do you see the wiring between the Apollo and the laptop? There's Wait, no what? wiring. Oh my gosh! <laughs> what the heck? And that's Bluetooth. It's Bluetooth. It's it's in it's in the cactus. It's in <laughs> <laughs> it's a Bluetooth cactus. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to show you that because that drove me nuts when I seen it. Oh, People think God. it's gonna be that clean. No, it's not gonna be that clean. No. You don't have enough ports. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and that's on their your on their website. Sorry, Isaac. You no, no, no. It's good. That is, that's probably the one thing that no one ever tells you when you get into this business. How much money you're actually going to spend on cabling. spend, right? Yeah. yeah. Like oh, cabling. Oh, God. <laughs> you're lucky to make a profit, y'all. You're lucky to make a profit. <laughs> yeah. All right. So here's my space. Oh, I flipped it back around. <laughs> All right. So I'm using an old D command console. That's my favorite board. Yeah. <laughs> um, NS10s, these are the 80s of from course. the 1980s. NS10s, uh, 1031 Genelex. Uh, yeah. the, the monitor is actually a Slate Raven because of that. I couldn't twist the knobs on my plugins, so I can just touch the screen and actually adjust plugins with that. Um, but that's the real Pro Tools, or is it again? Yes, this hack? is real Pro Tools. <laughs> <laughs> this is real Pro Tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've messed you up forever now, haven't I? <laughs> you messed me up now. Each time I'm going to see that, I'm going to ask, is it that <laughs> fake or is it the real deal? <laughs> so I'm still in the process of putting my studio together and I'm pulling stuff out of boxes that I've had sitting in boxes for a long time. Uh, this is the first time I've actually gotten to pull out all my gear. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll, uh, my patch bay is a mess right now because I'm still doing the wiring and all that kind of stuff. I have another patch bay laying around here somewhere, but, uh, Wait, Apollo... is that a helicon? Yeah, it's an old helicon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. it's, it's, stuff has been sitting yeah. in boxes for like years. Yeah. Uh, the I, I said, yeah, those distressers don't, you don't have place for the distressers. You can ship them over. I, don't, <laughs> I, I will make place. <laughs> Hey, dude, I got a whole empty rack that I got sitting in the back right now. Okay, look. <laughs> um, this Neve, this is a Neve uh, 1272 Pre. It actually belonged to the guy who voiced probably a lot of our childhood. Um, he was the voice of Professor Utonium. He was the voice of Yoda. He was the voice wow. of um, like Frank all, the Disney, all the Disney movies and all that kind of stuff. This was Ooh. his preamp. Uh, so he just recently had a stroke like two years ago and he called me up and he said, this, he goes, this is yours. So he gave me, he, he retired from the industry and gave me that, that Neve. Uh, this is an empirical labs, uh, Mike E, uh, pre with a, with a, basically mm -hmm. a distressor built into it. Uh, DBX. Oh, this rack here is the Midas XL 48, 48 channels of pre. All the uh, DBX 160s, uh, another DBX 166. I have an Aphex Expressor, mm. uh, a BSS compressor, uh, an old Ibanez. Uh, this was like a, a guitar processor, but I loved the compressor in it. Um, it's like from the 80s. Mm. So mm -hmm. I had to use that from time to time. This old art compressor a Pendulum uh, HZ-10SE, 
pre for acoustic guitar uh and then a bbe everybody had the bbe's right uh, yeah point. it's like everyone <laughs> has the bbl now so look i feel you <laughs> uh then we have a dbx 128 then this rack here is all the effects um i have this belonged to my dad before he passed i, I grabbed a lot of his gear uh but this is a, a tube pre a Bellari tube pre that i haven't plugged in yet uh lexicon pcm 60 a lexicon jam man this is a headphone unit i just threw it in there for right now to hold the place but a oh, Yamaha. Good. that's an old rain right yeah the old rain yeah so like yeah it's got that little like the rj45 power connector telephone cable yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh yamaha wow. rb7s two of them three spx 90s uh and then sonic dp4 uh roland srv 2000 Dude. the roland sde 1000 and this was made by ibanez um an sdr 1000 and this is another little lexicon down here, LXP1. Uh, but some of this stuff, so like these reverb units, this one here belonged to a producer engineer by the name of JB Baird, who mixed the, the Chris Gaines albums or the <laughs> yeah. Nice. So it, the uh so the presets, this this uh this Yamaha and this Yamaha SPX90 belong to him. So those presets that he used to mix for the album are in here Ooh, cool. uh, so uh but yeah, i was waiting you to finish because i thought you're gonna say you have also a bricasti m7 there. oh my gosh i, I wish waiting. i had a bricasti let me tell you look dude you're only you're a bricasti a couple 1176s and like three other compressors are away from a whole cla setup <laughs> <laughs> uh here's uh, a fostic 16 track belonged to my dad uh, i'm gonna try to figure out how to get it wired in and maybe start using some of that hit some drums to that uh, this whole rack here is my mobile rig. Uh, this is another mobile rig that I have here in this case. It actually belonged to JB Baird. Um, we have, oh yeah, I got a mess here, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we have a blue woodpecker ribbon How mic does that around. Sound? How does that woodpecker sound? Bro, it actually sounds really good, especially on violin. Um, I had it sounded incredible. on violin too. Oof. Uh, I love that blue. All the screen here uh, for to basically just put stuff on bass trap. So again, mm -hmm. here's the mess because I'm still building the place. So here's the mess. My hallway's a mess. Where are you mm -hmm. located, man? I'm in uh, Olathe, Kansas, or near Kansas City. Okay. Well, shoot. Look, now we're gonna have to. I'm gonna have to pull up now. <laughs> <laughs> so this Beautiful. is the tracking room. Love it. Nice. Nice vibe. I love, Very nice love vibe. those panels. Yo. Love, I love the yeah. design on the side of your panels. And then uh, this 87, this is a U87. I've oh, had it for 30 nice. years. This was the very first microphone my dad bought me to get into the industry. That's wow. awesome. So this nice. is very special for me. Uh, and then, again, before he passed, the last one that he bought for me was a Neumann. M147. Yeah, man, those are awesome. Dude, my, Correct. Condolences, my condolences to the loss of your father, yeah. Thank you. Um, but a nice gift. Yeah. A very nice gift. I mean, it just says a lot that, you know, he wanted to invest in me to make sure that I you know, was going to do this. Yeah. Uh, this is a Sennheiser 418. So it's a stereo version of the 416. Um, I just finished a guitar recording. Uh, these are AKG 460s. Uh, I have, uh, what else do I have? Ooh, nice I have pass an Abitone C12. What's that? That's a nice pass-through box. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Biodynamics. So here's, here's the thing. This box here actually came from a studio in Kansas City that closed down. Actually, a lot of the gear that I have came from studios that either the owners retired or were getting out of the business. And they just, you know, I helped a lot of people. So a lot of people just gave me gear. So even a lot of the stuff in the effects rack is just stuff that people gifted to me. So, oh, but yeah, wow. that's, that's my space. That's I my need to setup. make new friends. <laughs> <laughs> this is why networking is important. That's why it's yeah. I mean, you never know. Yeah, it, I mean, as musicians are, are transitioning, they're like, hey, I'm getting out of the business. You know, here's the stack of gear. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the SPX 90s was was that uh, a gentleman who played a lot of jazz 
around the city just was like, hey, man, I have no need for this. Do you want it? You got good. I'm just going to throw it in the trash. And I'm like, yeah, I'll take it. Jeez, I'm going to the trash. Well, they, well, they used to, that was like the, the SPX noisy. That yeah. was like the, the nickname for it. As long, yeah, as long as you don't drive them. But man, there's such like classic verb sounds. You've got the, the PCMs, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, yeah. like there, there are some I iconic things that are, that are, that you've got in that rack. But that, when, I, when I say this stuff has been sitting in boxes, like legit has been sitting in boxes for years and so this stuff hasn't seen the light of day for probably i would say at least 15 to 20 years this wow. stuff hasn't seen the light of day and it was because I, I was either touring you know running sound or working at other people's studios and all that kind of stuff and i never personally had a space to set this stuff up so this stuff has just been sitting so literally i'm pulling all this stuff out now that i finally built this space pulling everything out Getting, getting get re familiar with those classic reverb sounds and all that kind of stuff, and find all the hums and buzzes. Yeah, 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 totally. What are you, what are you going to use for your interface? Uh, interface is the Apollo, the nice. Apollo and the Rosetta, the Apogee Rosetta. I got my, you. My interfaces. Come on over so, to the antelope side, man. Get them thirty-two ins and outs. <laughs> listen, listen. So when I built this space, I had purposely set aside a budget to buy, I was going to buy the Neve uh, console. Ooh. I was going to do a, what is it, their 80 oh, series or whatever, because I, I, I cut my teeth on a Neve. And so I just, I know that sound, I know how to drive it, all that kind of stuff. And everybody who helped, the people that I hired to build the space screwed me over so much that the budget just dwindled like mm. nobody's business. Damn. And it, it hurt a lot. So literally, this space is an amalgamation of, uh, of a lot of pain, a lot of <laughs> trauma, um, and it, because because of the fact my dad and I were actually supposed to build it together, because he was a contractor, and so we were supposed to build it together, and he passed before all that happened, and so I had to rely on other people to do this stuff for me, and they just like would do things yeah. wrong, bro, like. You buy material and they're like, you'd come in and you're like, hey, oh, hey, that's not right. And they're like, oh yeah, well, you're gonna need to buy more material. And so the next contractor would come in, he would fix something that the other person would do. And I was just buying material after material. So then my dream for a console just started going down and down. And I then I started going, well, then I'll go with the Apogee or not the Apogee, the API of the box. I was like, that way I can at least get into the analog. And again, just the money just kept dwindling and dwindling. And so I was like, all right, so I'm looking at what, like what reference has is the satellite. I'd love to try to maybe even get into the satellite, right? You have the new satellite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So I'm 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 trying, bro. I want to get back into the analog world. I really do. Oh no, nah, it's a little. Listen, it's <laughs> it's not it's, like you're lacking in gear, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun on this side. Come on back, man. Come bro, on. Back. I will be. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's all about the budget. And you know, your wife's looking at you like, hey, but you already got all that stuff. She don't understand. Like, yo, this stuff is kind of, you know, I got mm -hmm. I got to, mm, I got to add, add more to it. So don't worry. Tell you look, you tell her there, there is a, the, the, the silver lining is coming and you won't have to buy nothing after. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, right, gentlemen, I think that'll conclude the show. Really all right. appreciate all y'all coming on and talking. Yeah, what yeah. a great conversation. Thanks for having us, man. In the chat. And of course, I say this every time, but. If you haven't done so already, please follow everyone in the chat. Every one of these guys go live and they share their knowledge. They share their mixes. Um, if you are interested in hiring any engineers, I already know all these guys are available. So it's it's um, what I said earlier. Don't be afraid to reach out. You know, our DMs are all open. So that, that's something to, to consider. But again, I can't thank you all enough. And, and everyone in the chat really do appreciate the conversation. We do this every Tuesday, 8 a.m. Mountain Time USA. So um, set your notifications. Uh, Isaac, you're always welcome, Will, you. uh, Kristen, Brian, as you know, um, you know, we're going to keep stacking this up and obviously more and more people are becoming interested in it. So, uh, again, can't appreciate y'all, but uh, I can't say I appreciate you enough, but either way, uh, until next time, gentlemen, thank you so much, everyone in the chat. Thank you. Be blessed everyone. Until next time. See you. Bye.